So, start well while she's wrapping up her counseling session. I'll just read the chapter titles, and then that can be a good starting point. Her titles are Chapter One: Meeting a Mystic. Chapter Two: Heart of Service. Chapter Three: Yes, I will marry you. Exclamation point. <laughs> Chapter four, volcanoes and honeymoons. Chapter five, diving deeper. Chapter six, my life is not my own. Chapter seven, sleep versus God. <laughs> Chapter eight, carried from darkness to light. Chapter nine, choose wisely. Chapter 10, One Lesson, One Mind. Chapter 11, Divine Providence. Chapter 12, I Want to Go Home. Chapter 13, Power of Decision. Chapter 14, Death, Doubts, and a Big Green Monster. Chapter 15, The Grand Finale in Cali. It's Cali, Colombia, down in South America. Chapter 16, Don't Let Go. Chapter 17, Imprisonment versus Freedom. Chapter 18, Two Worlds Collide. Chapter 19, Releasing Specialness. Chapter 20, <coughs> Fear of Loss and the Source of Love. Chapter 21, New Beginnings. Chapter 22, Teach Only Love. Chapter 23, Intimacy is with God. Chapter 24, I am calling you out of the world. Chapter 25, The Script is Written. Chapter 26, Steadfast Devotion. And finally, Chapter 27, I am home. So this, this really, I think, is going to be a, an excellent teaching device because <clears throat> there was a book that inspired me in the early years from two Course in Miracles pioneers that were traveling around the United States and Canada. Up, they were called the Varleys, and their book was The Peace of God is My One Goal. And I found this, their little book, which was really an experiential little book, how they were following the Holy Spirit and making all their plans and trusting and they were joined by two friends who were singer-songwriters, uh, Oman and Shanti, and going out on the road with them. And I first found that book when I was at Ken and Gloria Wapnick's um, center, Lake Tanana, up in, in the Catskill Mountains. And I was so inspired by the book, I just read it straight through. Then I recorded it on a little cassette recorder, back in the days we had, and then yeah. a cassette player in my yeah. car, so I yeah. played it continuously, and I was just lit up and inspired. And that was very much uh, hands-on, on listen and follow, and the demonstration of how joyful it is when you do make that connection and follow. And then this book is uh, very much a story of parables from Kirsten's life and my life, um, I think from around the end of 2004 to around 2007, all journaled. She had kept excellent journals, and she had actually posted a lot of her journalings on our Yahoo Awakening in Christ group back then. So people were waiting for the next installment. <coughs> like, oh my God, what this? What is she going through? And and she was like posting them, all of her doubts and fears and jealousies and and struggles and everything, just like an open book of open journaling. And she also kept really good detailed journals. So her and her mother and some others really combined to comb through those and make this. But to me this is, this is about practical spirituality. It's about what's your living experience. It's not about theologies and just high ideas and mantras. It's about actually the lessons that you learn, and then as you learn them, it transfers to all of us. You know, that's why we have mentors, that's why we have way showers, that's why we look up to people. 
a lot of people grew up in an era where they, they watched a lot of Oprah Winfrey and she was a, very much of a role model, a living role model. And Whoopi Goldberg grew up watching the Beatles, <laughs> so she's in the movie <laughs> about how she, she followed and was inspired by them and trusted. So here comes Lexi and Kirsten. I've just read the titles of all 27 <laughs> chapters to, to stir up maybe some curiosity even. <laughs> Yep, 27 chapters, Not including the, chapters. the last one, I Am Home, and just given a little uh, context of the whole thing. This is our, I think, this is um, Rita's book, so if she wants to sign, but we're using it for props. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> for that's now. fine for me. So really, we have, it's, we're here to join with you, and we're here for you, but, but basically, this is the time. We're also into complete transparency. So, if you've ever had questions about the spiritual journey, what is awakening, what does it even mean, Rita was bringing that up, what does awakening mean, the context of, of forgiveness, and then specifically um, with interpersonal relationships, there's so much mirroring that goes on, and it's really like a fast track, and I always say that. Relationships and silence and stillness are the fastest ways to God, to know God. So preferably a combination of stillness and relationship. You know, whereas sometimes they would run off to the monasteries and convents and kind of try to pray their way or meditate their way to God. But I think the course with its relationship pathway and your draw into the stillness is the absolute most accelerated way of clearing away this darkness. Mm -hmm. But, that's the good thing about having us here. We were drawn here to be here and we're so transparent, so I think it's a golden opportunity, really, to, to even to speak from your heart, if there's still things coming up about relationships, still if you're noticing thoughts, emotions, things. It could be parent-child relationships, as Charlotte was sharing, or it could be any uh, worker, employee, it could be partnerships of, of different kinds and varieties, but yeah, it's a, it's a prime opportunity <laughs> to, to ask us anything. Mm -hmm. yes, I, I, I ask both of you, um, I was talking with Frida about what she's going through and she's ready to give her whole life over to uh, service. And, and I have the same thoughts, but I have resistance because I have a 14 year old son and he's in high school and I don't feel comfortable not paying child support and being supportive. And I remember, David, in your parable, you said when you first started studying the Course, you thought you were going to go up on the mountain, and, but you had to pay your, your student loans off and all that other good stuff. So, is that where I'm at? Yeah, that's a good question of how practical the Holy Spirit is. That you're never kind of yanked out of what you believe, but you're kind of unwound. That's why I use that title in my book, Unwind Your Mind Back to God. But it's, even with the early, with Jesus and the Apostles, there, in the Arantia book, they said that there was one Apostle that was assigned to the other Apostles' families. So, here Jesus, calls twelve apostles, and some of them have family duties and obligations. So they had an entire apostle of the twelve, it says in the Urantia book, that, was, that would stay in communication, that would offer funds, support, and so on and so forth. And that really is a symbol, you know, it's not, you can't find that in the Bible, but if you find these symbols, People may wonder, well, were there any married apostles, and did they have children, and how did they deal with the children, and so on and so forth. You can see from that, it all has to be taken care of. That no matter how you wind your mind into the belief in time and space, the Holy Spirit has to unwind it. And, and it's done with great integrity, and great love, and presence, and gentleness. And it's not this sense of necessarily abdicating on 
ego responsibilities, but it's more of giving those ego responsibilities, could be debts, could be all kinds of responsibilities, over to the Holy Spirit and saying, now you show me, you lead the way. So it's done with integrity, and it's done in a way that, that is helpful. And also, Kirsten has shared in, in the book that, that that was part of how she came into God, was, was two head injuries, um, really pretty severe head injuries to the point of feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm coming close to killing myself twice, through the sporting a mountain bike and a skiing um, accident. So you can see that that was kind of a wake-up call, like, ooh, I'm coming close to killing myself. And then, uh, down on my knees, kind of uh, awakening experience, where it's like a, a, a mystical experience, and then at that point, having to go through an unwinding process uh, around different things, really beliefs and, and thoughts in the mind, but, but you know, that's really what the book's about, is, is about how patient the Holy Spirit is, and these unwinding things, when the mind thinks, now I've got it, now I, I see how this goes, and the Spirit's like, not quite, and then there's another turn, and oh, I got it now, I got it, no, another turn, it's like unwinding a screw from a board of oak wood, you can't yank it out, you have to do it one turn at a time. And I think, if, if it's really the desire of your heart to go for spiritual awakening, uh, we've had so many experiences of people that we've met that have had pretty rapid um, reflections of coming in to show the way, once the prayer of the heart is. You were even saying during the break, you were talking to Lexi and then Rita, and they were like looking at going through this unwinding, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, we're, we're going to the same retreats, or we're going to the... Both of them. Both of them. And then all of a sudden you both live out here, and so it was like, that's a fast answer to a prayer. Which is very practical, you know, where it's, you come together and you go, whoa, this is practical. In our mystical mind training program, people often pray and often are assigned mind training partners. And that's probably the thing they remember most about the Mystical Mind Training Program. It's a great curriculum, but they have someone that they're working with one-on-one, -on -one, which keeps, they can share their miracles, they can share their fears and doubts with. So, it's kind of like a buddy system. And in some ways, you know, that's how we were used too, because we were so devoted to the purpose. And the unwinding was so intense at times, almost like give up intense, wanted to throw the towel in intense, that the spirit was so strong and pretty much kind of forecast that there would be a love without end and it would be transcendent and it would be invulnerable, but you have to be very thorough in letting go of, of the sense of personal control and all the things we've learned from the past about survival and, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I feel that that's, that's a big part of it, Rich, is that, that, you know, you've got that calling, and you've talked about it like with Rita, but it's at a point now where that has to kind of ignite. Mm -hmm. And that was like our phone call last night we had with Sean. It's really all about igniting that. Every chapter that you were reading while she was coming up there is auspiciously what uh, is on my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> every, every single one, of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 27 like checks. I, like this whole gathering is very auspicious to me that we're talking about the very subject that I think I've been thinking. Yeah, it's a huge part of it, realizing that you're you're not alone in it, and that's so much of it. Like, if you really believe that you're responsible, you know, as the parent for your son and the child support, then you're beholden to the world, you know, and 
And so it's about giving over that belief that you are beholden to the world in some way and being with that, like really being with that belief in your mind. And that's what I did all the way through the book. I wouldn't let one little thing like that go by. It's like, okay, well show me, what does that mean? How am I beholden? What is beholden? What do I believe I'm responsible for? Show me it in every way possible. And I would, I would almost get a vision of, um, you know how a diamond has, has many faces? It's almost like each belief is like a, a diamond that's embedded and you have to like get there and like almost uncover every every side of it, like an archaeologist would, to have the whole thing loosened, so that the whole thing can really be seen and then given over to the spirit, like in prayer. And and show me the movies that, that bring me the sections in the course. Just she keeps showing me everywhere in the reflections of my mind where this what this is, and then asking for the help to then be relieved of the personal responsibility. And that's the other big part of it, I think, is just accepting the help that comes in. Like when you mentioned that about the buddy systems, like we've seen that just with support. There's that old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And it's like, yeah, but in this kind of society, everyone feels responsible for their own children. That means their own income, their own mortgage, their own car, their own house, their own child. You know, it's yeah. everyone has their own personal. personal everything. But that's a lot of upkeep. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? You, know, you pop over to Samoa, <laughs> you know, an, an island in the Pacific Ocean, and the village takes care of the children. And mm. the men go off and they do this together all day. And the mm. women go and do that together all day. And the little group come together and look after the children. No, it's like there's different cultures even in this world that show like there's a whole different way that things can be done and we just have to be so loosened up from our set beliefs of, of just because that's the way it's been done in the past is that the way that it has to be now? Is that really the calling? You know, or could there be something else in staying so open? Yeah, you realise you're totally wrong about everything. <laughs> yeah. I think too, if you're so willing to to give give it all over to the spirit and go for it, then the spirit knows how to, to do the excavation and take those the dirt from away from every aspect of the diamond. And that's I think really the value of relationship. A lot of traditional pathways to God were more about <coughs> segregating men and women and, and, and going off away from people. And the Course is like saying, no, we'll use the people exactly where they are, they're at just the right place and they're in your life for a purpose and we can reinterpret those relationships and take them to a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me I was, I was quite detached and I was kind of like a traveling mystic when we first met in New Zealand. I had gone around to different countries and was quite just showing up at gatherings and doing gatherings like this for some years. And so I was kind of in the swing and the rhythm of having given my life over and and not really looking for a relationship and, and actually uh, I guess I was just walking by a room where you were getting ready to meditate and Person was like, I, I'm getting ready to meditate. Would you like to join me? And I, yeah, that sounds good to me. And that's how it started. I just walked into the room and sat down, and we meditated together and had a real deep meditation. Then there was more forecast, as the book says, of her coming back. Uh, I had a little peace house. I was doing a global ministry with global travels out of this little <laughs> peace house built in the 1800s, and. And basically I had two cats, a four-legged cat, a three-legged cat, and the people that had been assisting me, one couple moved uh, to Canada and another a friend of mine who had been my assistant for five years, she had just got married, was just had left to go get married. So it was me and the cats in the global ministry. And enter Kirsten, even though Kirsten wasn't even aware that JC Central was running everything. <laughs> How many people did it 
take telling you five five I people know. down in New Zealand kept saying, so you're going to Cincinnati to be with David in his peace house. And she said, no, I'm not. And then, so you're going to Cincinnati to be with David in his peace house. I don't think so. And so by the fifth, it was, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> uh, but this is where you start to see that that you don't really have charge of the awakening, you just have to be willing, and then the Spirit will send in the people you're supposed to meet, the encounters, the movies, everything will be given when you have the desire for it. You don't even have to figure out the means. Yeah. The Spirit will provide the means even. He wouldn't give you a goal, peace of mind, without giving you the means to achieve the goal. So that was very much involuntary, like all miracles are, and then when she came over, as she started answering the phone and just like, really trying to be truly helpful, because the cats weren't doing anything. They, <laughs> they, they had me playing doorman for them. That was, and they were feed me and cuddle me, love me, and and open the door and close the door. You know, it was, that was it. But when Kirsten started answering the phone, calls were coming in, healing calls, and then. She just started, her body start, had been cold for years, started to get hot. She had to take cold showers sometimes during the day because the heat, the energy was so strong of going from a head injury into jumping into being used by the Holy Spirit a lot during the day. So the body went from cold to like a conductor, you know, there were a huge amount of energy and electricity just passing through. And then when it became apparent that we were to be in a relationship, the body of David was, was how many years, 12 years younger than this, but still, it was like, what are you thinking, this is not, he's not my type, <laughs> you know. But first she's called over there from New Zealand and then, you know, and then, I mean the things that I would just do, like when I had been in New Zealand, I, I would wear sandals, but I, I wore socks. <laughs> and she would just look and just go, Oh, God. so not cool. So not cool. <laughs> so not my type. Socks and sandals. You know, this isn't like Switzerland. This, this is New Zealand, you know. And it was little things like that, like being off in a room, and I, like when I brush my teeth, I make sure I really brush them good, and I and spit out and rinse and everything. And she's in sometimes in the other room, just having huge reactions to. <laughs> What she called my hoiking noises, I've never even heard of hoiking. I don't know what hoiking is. I'm, I'm rinsing and spitting. I don't know what hoiking is. But for her it was like, you know, she'd be in the room. And this was like the kind of forgiveness lessons. Noises, sounds, smells. And then also, all my wardrobe is donated. People give me clothes. I don't like go out to out the stores and try to color coordinate and this and this. I get donated clothes, so so she gets into my wardrobe and I think just coming there to be of service was no problem. As soon as she thought that this was a relationship, she was thinking, there is no way I'm going to be caught dead with a man wearing... And so she goes through my wardrobe and that's what's all in the book. These kind of situations which are all undoing the self-concept. But and then wanting to be spiritual. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, I'm supposed to be spiritual, I'm not supposed to have all these judgments in my mind now. <laughs> and that's what was so unbearable. <laughs> I watched these videos of David and he's wearing this women's apricot track suit. <laughs> and I I'd like the color. <laughs> I didn't the know they were filming. Who <laughs> cares? Women's apricot tracks. It wasn't Eckhart Tolle aware, no, it was, it was, it was colorful. California colorful. But it's like my mind, you know, like this is the kind of stuff that needed to come up. Like if it was up to Kirsten, she'd have got, you know, 
if she'd have got the partner dressed in the cool clothes, you know, just yeah. snowboarding, whatever. <laughs> 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 and those kind of things, like, they would have been in the mind, the kind of subtle judgments, but you can just get away with them. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you're, like, partnered up, and it's like this, the spirit's doing this, partnering for the healing of the mind. Like, do I want judgment-free, eternal love? Or ego at personal preferences, mm-hmm. you know, where you're trying to match everything up in a superficial way. And so it was just this, yeah, everything got seen. I mean, yeah, it's just so funny because I, I hadn't heard of no private thoughts before, but that's where I started to learn about what it meant. Like if I had these judgments in my mind and I didn't want them there and I tried to hold them back, I would go from feeling that being in love and being in this beautiful collaboration of serving God together to then there's a gap and the longer the gap stayed it's like the bigger the gulf got just from one judgment about like a toothbrushing noise or an apricot track suit (laughs) and then in the end I'd be thinking about New Zealand and it's like yeah I don't even know really what I'm doing here Mm. I'm not even in love what, what is you know it's like mine would just start to turn away from God yeah. like away from the spirit's plan and once I started to feel like that then it would be like wow what just happened so it was a real devotion of like being willing come back be honest be transparent and and be met with this innocence you know, every time in the end. <laughs> it was so adorable. Yeah, I told her, I wish she said something about the clothes. I said, well, you know, if we're partnered up for the spirit, then go through the whole wardrobe and do do what you will with it. Mm-hmm. Keep it, throw it out. Ken doll. Give me, yeah, uh, this will be your Ken doll. And, <laughs> and, because I, I didn't really care about yeah. the clothes Obviously. anyway. To me, they were just like, they were donated, I'd come in, I would let the spirit kind of go through me. And I've, and I've traveled with other people. I remember there was a time, I think I was traveling through Australia with uh, Helena. And every place I went, we went to a lot of places, every place I would show up, I would be color coordinated with my clothes, color coordinated with the setting, with the backdrop. Oh, yeah. And she would watch this every time. She would say, unbelievable. Like color coordinated completely with whatever backdrop where we would go, every single time, over again. She said, there it is again, there it is again. And of course she was thinking, and why am I not color coordinated? So she decided she would let me get up first, pick my clothes, and she watched me. And then she would watch me shower and get dressed, and then she would see what I was wearing. Then she would pull into her wardrobe, and then she was then color coordinated. With wow. every place we went. The spirit is wow. that much into the nuances. When we say, give it over to spirit, let it dress you, let it speak through you, let it laugh through you, smile through you, hug through you, express love. Like they did with the Beatles, you know, wow. You know, those songs, love me do, and I want to hold your hand. I mean, we're all love songs. And the wonder the girls were screaming because their, their hunger for love mm-hmm. was met. Mm-hmm. Concert after concert album after album, movie after movie, yep. and the wonder, you, anybody would scream if you felt bereft of love and suddenly love came shining at you. And so that's pretty much the way it went in the sense that I was really uninvested in, in everything and then and we would come together and there were practicalities. Like with Kirsten having two head injuries, um, she would go through the day and then she would get into the afternoon and then all of her energy would go and she would have to sleep. And I, and I thought, oh that's delightful, that's like the Spanish culture, mm-hmm. siesta, uh, which I feel is very natural. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were in uh, preschool, kindergarten, mm-hmm. we would take naps. Yeah. I don't know what happened in first grade, why they started to <laughs> weed those out. <laughs> but uh, for me, I always liked siesta, so when she said, I, uh, I have to sleep, I would get, okay. And then I would sleep, and siesta, then she would come up, and I would hold her, and we would siesta together. And that's how the Holy Spirit handled head injury, no energy in the afternoon, it, you know, it was, we would siesta together. And it worked pretty good until we went on the road one time when we were 
driving up, I think, to Vermont or something like that. And then we were in this little tiny uh, Honda Insight, little uh, hybrid car, one of the first Honda hybrid cars, tiny little two-seater. And we're going up there and we need, I think we were supposed to be there for dinner and then a gathering. And we were, we were trying to make it up there and then the afternoon came and she said, I really, I really need to stop and sleep. And I said, hmm, it's, we're, we're just barely going to make it there for, for dinner. And she said, I absolutely have to sleep. And so we pulled this little Honda Insight to the side of the road, and cars and trucks were going by. And I was oh gosh, trying to, the car was shaking, like, and a big truck would go by, this tiny little car would just shake. And so we're both trying to siesta in this tiny little sardine can. It wasn't very restful until I finally was like, I, we need to go. We, we, you know, spirit orchestrates, gives you a gathering, a time for dinner with people. You know, it's like, so. And prior to that, for like six months, maybe even longer, we, every time we went on the road, we did make it on time to get to our host's house so that I could go and have a yes, rest, go yes. and have a siesta at three in the afternoon. But this day, this was the day where there was no opportunity at all to stop. And even though we tried, it was like, no, it's just not the guidance. And the ego so, did come up. Like, oh, yeah. my mother would get me a hotel. Oh and, God. you know, it was, all the my mother thoughts started coming in. And she would, she loved me. She would take <laughs> care of me, you know. And so all of them started to come up. And mm -hmm. But we did have to kind of go forward. And I know for Kirsten, I could feel like, oh, here it comes. The ego's going to, is trying to come in big time. And then by the time we got there, um, I did meet with some of the people and we were just sitting down for dinner and Kirsten had tried to sleep but couldn't. So you went off for a walk in the woods and mm -hmm. that's the story. That's cool. I wish I was eaten by a bear. Yeah. <laughs> that the ego got so off and so stirred up that when she was walking, that's, that was some of the thoughts you were having. Yeah. I wish a bear would eat me. And then David would care. Then, then David, David would, would see. Yeah. This is not the way sure. the day was supposed to go, but then that was a big point because that was also the point where she was so identified with the head injury and needing to sleep in the afternoon that that, that was the point where the Holy Spirit was going to say, let's, let's go past these thoughts. You know, the pattern isn't you. And that was like, a, it turned into a huge breakthrough day when you were walking in the woods. That, that was like a major yeah. turnaround. It was, because I'd my personality type was always to push, push <coughs> myself and get over something fast, get on with it, you know, and always like going for everything high speed. And this journey for me that has been all about letting that go and being, shown, being told and shown that I'm not in control and it's not up to me and I can't push my way through it all and make it happen. And so I'd come to a surrender point with these symptoms and I hadn't really accepted the idea that I would have them for life, but I was willing, if that was true, I'd come to such a point, like, okay, I just have to accept every afternoon that I do have to rest and not push it. And any time I tried, I'd got more of a headache, you know, and more of a strain. And so there was a real fear there. If I pushed it again, I would be in pain again. But this was the day. You know, and that was what was so amazing about it. Like, there is no accident. The whole day was orchestrated that there was no chance to rest. Mm -hmm. And so that was the day when so I went on that walk. And at first it was like, oh, I just want to be eaten by a bear. You know, I just want to die. I just want to be, this to be over. David doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me, and you know, just went, what am I doing? What am I thinking? <laughs> and then that's when I started to question it. Like, is that true? Is it true David doesn't love me? Like, no. Well, is it true that he's not supporting me? That's a hard one. How can I see <laughs> that he's supporting me in this? And then that's where I could get right down and turn it around and go, well, what if he is supporting me? What if this is the guidance and this is the moment? Mm -hmm. And then I could go underneath, what do I want? What do I really want? 
And then I could see the question, do I want to continue to insist that I have to protect myself from pain? And it's like, no. I do want to be free of this. And in that seeing of that decision and that prayer, that was when the whole thing lifted up into the possibility that, that this could be the moment. And it was. I just I felt it in my mind. And then I went back to the house and it was like the whole house glowed. It looked like a Thomas Kincaid painting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just like twinkling soft light of God flying out the windows. And I opened the door and David and everyone was sitting around the table as if they were all waiting for me. <laughs> it's on a prayer mission. And then that was the beginning of the end. Like from then on every day it was like, well, I'm open to resting, but I'm open open if it doesn't come in. Let's not plan for it anymore. And then it just loosened and loosened and loosened to the point yeah. where it's yeah, yeah. yeah. And that that was such an important miracle and moment. And then I think it, as you go through the book, you start to realize that <clears throat> that God has a plan for for awakening from this dream of. of pain and suffering and sickness and death, and that the ego has a plan for keeping you here for as long as it can, because its very seeming existence depends on your mind. It's like a parasite that is feeding off of a mind that was actually created by God, but now is bought into a a puff, a tiny mad idea, and now this little tiny Puff is is like a parasite that's feeding off of this divine mind energy to perpetuate a world of time and space and to perpetuate sleep. Like the Dark City movie I was talking about where the dark ones, the dark characters, they just walk up to people and they put their hand over their face and they just go, sleep. And they put their hand over their face and they go down like this and they're always going around with one purpose, sleep. Sleep. They're very vicious and dark and creepy looking and in the movie they're going around, that's all they do. They walk up to people, sleep, you are going to sleep. And then the spirit's purpose is to wake us up from this dream of separation and, and suffering and sickness, pain, division, conflict. So what Kirsten started to discover and discovers through, through this journey of these years in the book is that there is a plan that God's God called us together and we're being used in this holy relationship, not only for us, but for the whole universe. And it's mm-hmm. to free the mind that's sleeping and dreaming. It's not freeing David or freeing Kirsten. And then the ego is quite threatened by this awakening plan, because it wants you to stay asleep. So what it does is it generates plan B's. Like God is plan A, and the ego counters plan A with lots of plan B's. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we've been in relationships, you know, there's many fish in the sea. (laughs) If this one doesn't work out, there's always plan B, C, D, E, F. You know, we do this with jobs, we do it with relationships, we do it with spiritual paths, we we do it with so many things. Even when we go to the grocery store, you know, we have an idea what's on our list, and then there's plan B. If they don't have (laughs) this, we're going to always fall back on plan B. So plan A is forgive and release the attack thoughts and you'll be free and happy. And plan B's are, there are so many. And I think that's what comes through in in the book. Because there was actually a time when we went down to, I think it was Columbia, where uh, a friend of mine had was hosting us. And we were in her apartment. Did you ever see the Miss America pageants on on TV, Miss America pageants? Yeah. Did you ever see the Miss World <laughs> pageants where the, the women... This, my friend was like Miss World. She was bubbly and happy. She was studying the course and <laughs> she looked like the winner <laughs> of the Miss World pageant. And here we are n- newly using the rings and the symbols and everything down there and I think that was the first time you said in your entire life that the feeling of jealousy came up. Never did you have that with boyfriends, any relationships, siblings, but this green beast <laughs> arose. 
See how the Holy Spirit does it? Well, we'll get that feast up. <laughs> or need is Miss World to come in here. And... When I was going through my Mary Poppins phase. Yeah, she was going through Mary Poppins. I was letting and... it all go and <laughs> not caring about how I looked. But we were down in Columbia, and, you know, <laughs> Columbia is down by the equator, and we're going out and speaking to all these groups, and the people are all looking at me, and most of them are women in the crowd, and they're looking over at Kirsten. And Kirsten is wearing turtlenecks. Turtleneck sweaters in Colombia, and so I could see the women are kind of going, like they're just given an odd look. Like, can you relate to that girl up there? You know, and this and this. So eventually, we went out with Miss World, my friend, and she said, "Come on, we'll take you shopping." So she took us around, and she was picking out. I had to be willing to be the Ken doll. It was your turn. It was your turn. Barbie. You were going to be Barbie, and you were going to be redressed by the Holy Spirit for Kali Columbia. Mm -hmm. So my, my friend Lily picked out tank tops. Tank tops, and show some stuff, girl, and da 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 da. You know, and this was... And Kirsten was like... And, and if I, I'm like, what's the problem? What's the problem? What is the problem with, with what... Lily's bringing you in, she's going to help dress you for down here so we can get the message through here so the people can relate to you. And Kirsten's like, I cannot speak in front of a group of people at A Course in Miracles gatherings and show any nipple. <laughs> that was the thought. <laughs> and I was like, what? Wait a minute, what kind of top was it? <laughs> <laughs> Rich wants the details, I want photos. <laughs> Come on here. No, I'm not <laughs> This, this was, but this was the thing she was going through, from turtleneck to tank top, you know, was, in other words, you have to let the spirit take over your life. It's almost like the body is like a puppet, and the spirit wants to use the puppet to shine the light, in whatever is appropriate, in whatever situation. But, but the spirit knows what's best, and that's why the whole journey, and through the book, is such a journey of trust and surrender. Because the past association as a personality will, self will say, I like to wear these kind of clothes, these are my styles, these are my colors, mm -hmm. these are my eye colors, or my nail colors, and so on and so forth. And then the spirit's like, well, it's actually like a play, and I have to dress the doll up to be appropriate. You know, we, we want to go places where people can relate to us. The spirit's use of the symbol takes priority over the preferences of the ego for what the impact can be. And we know that. Even the Beatles were, were dressed up. They were wearing like really, yeah. really casual kind of clothes. And when Brian Epstein got a hold of them, he, he took them to a tailor. And the tailor measured them and dressed them up. And there they were. And, and the crowds started to grow. The places they played in, I think they, when it was early years, they went to like Hamburg and people were throwing stuff on the stage and broken glass and strip clubs and, and people rushing the stage and all this and this. Brian Epstein, entered, Holy Spirit brings in Brian Epstein, dresses them up in suits, boots. does their haircuts, boots. And, boots. Yeah, and beetle boots, and boom! <laughs> and you see, it was like uh, Chris was saying, who was the guy, that, the music producer that said that was... Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin said that the Beatles were proof of the existence of God. Oh my God. Rick Rubin said, and when you watch this movie, or you know anything about the Beatles, you can see the, the love and the joy and the reflections. It's almost like a giant meteor hitting the surface of the water and sending out a tsunami of love. It was that strong. So, so we're bringing it down to the context of how it was for us, because in, in one sense, we were used in the same way, and that's what's so great about the book, how transparent it is of what's going on inside, mm -hmm. with all of these real deep prompts from the Spirit, that are really to benefit the whole universe, but they seem to be impacting on, on Kirsten and the David. And, yeah. and so it's, it's really amazing when you look at it, because I think, you know, there, there were mystical experiences, there was lots of, of opportunities, and there were times when I think it was when we were in New Zealand where there was like a whole unconscious story that Kirsten had on how her adult life was to go. There was an idealistic little, tiny little alpine um, village 
in the South Island of New Zealand. And, and you know how they say, sometimes little girls picture their wedding, and picture the details of the wedding, you know, when they go. She had kind of an unconscious program running of, of how she would live in this little town called Wanaka, and the kind of life she would have, and the kind of lifestyle, and the kind of partner. And I did feel when we would travel together, when we would come near New Zealand, it would even be activated. So she's like, David, come to Wanaka, you've got to see Wanaka. It was, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. like being in the Wizard of Oz, well, let's go see the wizard. Like, don't, we can't waste any more time, we have to see the wizard. It was almost like implied, like I would just go and I would go, Wanaka, why I've missed you my whole life, forget the rest of the world. I am in Wanaka, and you know, that I somehow, I would, I would dress like suave and get my hair cut and, and get skis or something and be there and I would just fill the, into the fantasy of Wanaka. By the time I got to Wanaka, I had heard so much of Wanaka, but I finally pulled up there and I was like, so this is Wanaka, you know, it's like, to me, one place is the same as every other place, you know, it's, really, honestly, it, I love them all, they, they all feel the same to me, but, but for, that was like a major part, because that was almost like an unconscious fantasy of how your future was to go, almost like, you know, like uh, Carolyn Mace talks about, you know, you script things, before you even come into this world, you, you kind of have an agenda of what you're going to do, and it's all really part of a prearranged plan. Well, here was the Holy Spirit's guidance and the way our life was going, coming up against Monica, and that, <laughs> that turned into, that was like a major, major thing. Yeah, shift. Yeah, it was a real deep attachment. Because I went down there and that was the first experience I had of opening up spiritually. Too. I learned to meditate there and met spiritual friends and everyone was into some kind of spiritual lifestyle like they were Reiki teachers or massage therapists or organic coffee shop <laughs> or they were a snow patrol you know, ski patrol and it was just a time where I let go of the world to go down there <coughs> and this is also where they filmed Lord of the Rings yeah. So, really you know, Beautiful. this was, not surprising me, this was the fantasy of like, this is where I want to live my life. Town Imagine. of 5,000 people, no traffic lights, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's into the environment, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's just very pristine. And then, yeah, going, and I, so I left my car parked there, and I left my skis there, and a couple of, and some belongings, and then was launched so quickly on this journey, I'd gone up north for a, anyway. Ended up traveling with David, so I'd been away for probably a year and a half, and it was time to go back to Wanaka and get my car out of there. <laughs> but the I, I could feel it; it was almost like oil and water are not going to mix. Like David is the symbol of letting go of the whole world, and Wanaka, <laughs> <laughs> the best there, of the world, the best, the best of the world has to offer. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and the guilt every time, I'm like, oh, what's it going to be like? And hoping that when yeah. we got there, maybe all my friends would be there. We'd have they'd all be into the course by the time we got there. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a spiritual. David would get a nice haircut and some ski jackets and <laughs> <laughs> swim in the summer and ski in the winter. But alas, alas. 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 We got there, and all of my old friends were out of town. <laughs> and so we had one gathering at the local kind of spiritual um, venue there, and there were just a few people, and they were, it was like, it could have been any spiritual gathering. They really weren't deeply into the course. It's like, okay. But this, the further we drove away as well, it was really intense in my mind. And it was a huge plan B. And we have no idea how deep these plan Bs are like in the mind. It's, it's in consciousness itself. Like There's some very deep holding on to some aspect of the world. And you know, underneath that is fear. Like, who am I without that? Just in case. Mm -hmm. When it's been there for so long. Curious. Yeah. Who am I without that Wanaka? And if I really let go of that place and that possibility, then... Is this all there is? And all there is at this time, even though it was amazing, 
also involved a lot of dealing with the ego. You know? yeah. So it's like this memory of all of these beautiful, gentle, walking by the river, learning about guidance, you know, opening up to spirituality memories and going further through the darkness to the light. So, and I, but it was a decision I had to finally see very clearly, like exactly what is it here that I'm deciding for. And it was beautiful because I, you know, we talked through it as much as we could and we were driving away and I was like, you know, being torn. And then finally we drove across the country to stay with a friend. And it's like I couldn't go any further. We were meant to drive all the way back up north and I just, I wanted to go back to Wanaka. And we stayed with our friend for like three days, <laughs> like with oh. me in limbo. And then finally David said, well, I'm flying north. So he just... For a gathering for a, plan. We had a gathering plan. So he booked his flight and went north. And at first I felt abandoned and betrayed. And how could he just leave me here? <laughs> but I had to have the space to just look at it and really see what do I want and be allowed to, to just even feel it. Because I'd gone beyond even trying to decide for myself my mind was then going to do I want this or this and when you get into that kind of thinking of trying to make a decision about things in form you've completely lost sight of the one decision you know what is your will for me so I just needed that spaciousness to stay with our friend for a couple of days and then he was driving in a different direction altogether from both places and I just followed him in my car <laughs> And then a, a day later, I could feel this is not the direction. And then another day later, I'm like, oh, I can feel it. I'm meant to be with David. Like, of course I'm meant to be with David. What was I thinking? <laughs> but then I could call yeah. and then just basically fly all the way back up north in the car. I think, too, the thing about Wanaka, it's really good that it's addressed in the book, but actually, Wanaka was more like the tip of the iceberg. Like, like, you know about icebergs, how you have the tip sticking out over the water and then they do these iceberg photographies and it's amazing. There's this little teeny thing and then there's this massive thing underneath. I, I had been through all that at Hermitage's experiences and faced so many undoings of this self-concept. And I know a lot of us, I remember Lindsay, you were saying one time you went off to the southwest to kind of be on your own and, and face all these things. I had done that and with with Kirsten, I knew that Wanaka was kind of like a fantasy or a lifestyle more on the top. She had a Subaru, all-wheel drive, and, and this ideal kind of idealistic place where Lord of the Rings was filmed and very simple and, and what the world would call beautiful and environmentally sound and on and on and on. And then underneath it, where is Wanaka? But Wanaka is in New Zealand and where are the parents? Originally they were from from England, but they, she was born and raised, and so there's country stuff under Wanaka. There's family stuff. Anybody ever growing up, oh, I want to marry somebody and live close to my parents. For others, it's I want to get as far away <laughs> from my parents as I can get, but you know how that goes. It's part of the self-concept. You know, and the parents have expectations. What kind of partner you'll meet, you get married, and have children, and you'll make us grandparents, and then you know, in, there's a lot down there underneath the tip. There's a lot of unconscious programming. That's just the tip. The fantasy is kind of like, you know, you maybe have a Tom Cruise fantasy or this fantasy or that fantasy, and then you get underneath it like, whoa, what is, wow. <laughs> and, and that's also dealt with in the book because the Wanaka experience was just one little episode, but then interactions with, with Roger and Jackie biological parents and, and, and the brothers and the conditioning of growing up and her expectations around men that related to your brothers mm -hmm. and their actions and reactions and how much they could be trusted or were they the kind to play around with you and dunk your head <laughs> down into the sand uh, when you're in the water and different things. You know, those are all things, you know, when people talk about father issues or mother issues, it's really ego issues. They're just unconscious programming that have to be raised up into awareness. So I was aware while it was all going on that, that this was all essential, like the, 
the ideal was just, it was devastating to the ego to even think about letting go of the ideal, but underneath that there was a lot more letting go required really, but I knew that that was the whole purpose of the relationship. And so, there was amazing experiences down there, frequent visits to New Zealand. It wasn't six years in a row, I think. Six years in a row we went down there. Yeah. And that just shows you, you were asking Rich about, with this 14 year old son and the unwinding, six years we visited New Zealand. And you know where New Zealand is, it's, <laughs> it's next to Australia. You know? And so, we think about Hawaii, and this is like New Zealand, and Fiji, and all these things, this is way down there, but that was beautiful. And then, I could see too that even our trips to other cultures, other countries, those were all like rapid, undoing any kind of vestiges of, of self-concept. And, and then, also just, you know, trusting too of where is this all heading. Because, I think, if all of us are honest, we would say, there are, there definitely are financial beliefs, there's beliefs in scarcity and lack that are underneath. If we had kind of like the free reign to do whatever we wanted to do in this world with no financial considerations whatsoever, that's kind of an interesting thing to ponder, like what would I do with my life if I had no concerns at all about money? None. And so, for Kirsten, she before I had met her, she went through this very guided thing. She was into all kinds of spirituality and the Course and yoga and everything, but she was guided to buy a house down in, which was the, was it the North Island? In the North Island. In the North Island. In the ski town. See, that was part of it too. Yeah, that wasn't even Monica. She had a house, a little chalet tucked away in a ski town <laughs> over there, so she had a house. And then, as we traveled, you know, she had numerous different, I guess, little stashes, bank accounts, and all kinds of things. She was like a squirrel. You know, she had, she had a chalet, she had things, she had her nuts buried all over the place. And she's traveling with a mystic who's like living in a divine providence, like, provide the air for me. If I need a piece of bread, look at the lilies of the field, look at the, the sparrows. You know, they, they can survive on a, on a piece of a berry, one berry for the day, and they happily sing all day long and, and take their berry. They don't have CDs and, and bank accounts and houses and all kinds of things like this. They're, they're free. They're free. That's why they're singing all day. They don't have possessions. So that's me, and then she's got stuff stashed all over the place. And, and to me, this is again the self-concept, because why would you stash stuff and own stuff and possess stuff unless you were afraid it wasn't going to work out. You know, that's the ego tells you save for a rainy day and then it tells you keep saving and keep stashing and it's never enough, you know, and then you find out after a while you don't have possessions, the possessions have you. The mortgage has you, the house has you. You know, you may even be in a relationship where you think, I don't feel very free. I feel like I'm like trapped and, and tied down. So basically, as we started traveling around and living in Divine Providence... I was talking the talk. And she was talking the talk, <laughs> live free and just, we live on donations and, you know, donate freely because we live a life of freedom and... Well anyway, Jesus was, I think Jesus is probably watching this whole thing. And so, we actually... Uh, got to a point where we didn't hardly have any, we didn't have books or anything, but we did start to have some CDs and mm -hmm. that was the CD stomping story where she, you know, stomp them, you put little labels. We, I just hand wrote them, I'd put the, hand write the title. I wasn't into, you know, we didn't have all these computer programs and high tech things, I just, oh, CD, burn it, stomp it, and write, write what it is. And then she was stomping I'm putting on these labels on these things, and, and that brought up a lot too, like, what do you think I am? I'm more, you know the skills and abilities I have, and I'm just stomping CDs. But then we went to, what was the name of the little town? Sheboygan. Sheboygan. I love the name. Sheboygan. I could say that forever. Sheboygan, Sheboygan. We went to Sheboygan to a church to do a gathering, and Kirsten had brought all of these stomped 
CDs along, quite a few of them, to put out, and she was in charge of resources, and she would usually give like a little talk at the end of, I would speak, and at the end she would say, we live on donations, and we brought some resources, and if you want to contribute a donation, she had a little two to five minute little spiel. But I was so excited for God that day, I just was going on and on, and I was happy, and my arms were flying around, and then the time was flying by. So it got to the very end of the gathering, and I just said, I said, remember what Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give, everything is for free, and I was in my, really, this was, and she was kind of sitting there, you could just tone it down a little bit with the free stuff. Uh, like this is at the free store, don't get a little, don't get, but I was like in the, the very end, and then time was up, and I said, well thank you all for coming. And then as I recall, there was a woman who was so happy with the talk and with the ending of the talk that she made a beeline. She just, before she could get a microphone, before she could do anything, the woman raced over to the resource table. And she had her hand open like this. And she scooped, she just went zoom, she just scooped. Like she spent, I don't know how much on every CD, the woman scooped, just, it was, I think it's called the scoop in there. The Mighty Scoop. The Mighty Scoop, she just scooped as many CDs as she could, these aren't even packages or cases, these are like individual, she scooped as many and she had a whole handful full, and she said, woo hoo, and raced out the door as Kirsten was, before Kirsten could react, to do anything, to say anything. Donation, or, but she couldn't even say donation, it was all happened so fast. And then the next place we went was Bumpity, which was a friend of mine, and I was doing, how many days was it? It was like, I don't know, four or five days a week, week thing, and so the people that are coming there were doing it, like we're doing today, it's all a box, a donation, isn't that? And they're donating to the hosts, because they're staying there, food, places to stay, and the person had put out a nice donation basket. Every day I would teach for hours, and Kirsten would, we'd have a great gathering, and she would go check the big donation bowl. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Not a zilch. Not a penny <laughs> in there. And she's like, so this went on for a couple of days, wasn't it? Two or three days. She just got angrier. Well, on the second day, the basket was in my eyesight, and David was talking, and I'd be like looking around, and then it was like, my mind, <laughs> I started getting addicted to looking at the donate, the empty donation basket. Oh. No, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. Day after day. And then finally, you know, Kirsten could share how this goes on with Jesus, because finally you, you really had to turn it over to Jesus, because it started to be very disturbing, like you were mm. being disturbed yeah. by the whole thing. Well, that night I went into prayer, because I was so upset with everyone. I was like, why are they withholding? Why aren't they valuing and supporting what's valuable? Like the whole thing was in my mind of what I would say. And so I went into prayer with Jesus and it was, it was like, what's going on? Why is there all of this withholding and it's not being valued? And, and then Jesus just had one very short sentence for me. He just said, where are you withholding? Ooh. Oh. So I went through my list <laughs> and I realized that, you know, we're talking, I was talking the talk. It's like, actually, I have a car in New Zealand, I have skis, I have a house, <laughs> you know, I have a bank account. It's like I had all these things still in my, mom, in my possession, really. And so I just went into prayer with them and gave them all over to the spirit in my mind just in the willingness to not hold on to them, not knowing what would happen in terms of letting them go. or But all I knew was that I wanted to be free of, of all sense of ownership and, and withholding. So, yeah, I just went kind of through that that night, and then the next day um, I just shared it with you, and then... I think it was the last morning and the whole thing was a reflection of my mind and the healing of my mind and this beautiful talk came out of David about divine providence 
nothing about lack, nothing about, you know, you need to give or anything like that. It was just purely about, like, the truth of everything being provided for so perfectly. And then one of the guys in the group, he said, well, it's okay for you, David. You go around with your donation basket, you know, and you get paid for what you do. It's all right for you. And David held up the donation basket, which was still empty. <laughs> it was the perfect setup for his question. And he said, oh, this donation basket. <laughs> and then just he went, oh. And David said, well, this is it. I don't have any expectations of you. I'm not dependent on you to put the money in the basket. I'm dependent on God. And this giving comes through God, and it comes through inspiration, and this is the joy of giving. It's just giving without holding back, yeah. and trusting that then everything will be given through that same inspiration. And so that was it. He gave this whole talk, and I was so happy, and then at the end of that, everyone came up, and you know, the basket was just filled to overflowing. That was another one of those lessons in Plan B. Because <laughs> Wanaka and New Zealand weren't just the plan B, they're, they're with, you know how it works, we, we're conditioned, we, we do save for a rainy day, we do invest, we do, you know, we're told that that's practical, you know, save for the future. And yeah, when you do look at the birds, we, we've been watching, uh, actually Jeffrey got us a, a bed and breakfast here in not too far from here, 15 minutes, and we were looking down over our perch, watching the bluebirds sail underneath us, below us and everything, and, and when you look at the birds, you know, yeah, they, they go through the day and you know they're chirping and singing and flying and playing and everything like this, but, but, but food is not, they're not considering, okay, what restaurant in LA should we fly to tonight? And do we need to call ahead for that? Do you have your GPS on? Uh, you know, and I've heard there's a long line there, and you know, it's a very popular restaurant, so you better check it out. They're not planning their day about going to a restaurant in LA, their favorite restaurant, and all the energy that it can take. Sometimes you get there and there's traffic or yeah. construction, and awesome. your whole thing goes, you may have a fantasy going in the afternoon, and it's all busted by <laughs> 8 o'clock at night, uh, and you don't even make it to the restaurant. But but this was good because, because these aren't just words I'm speaking, this is a living presence. You know, when St. Francis, Mother Teresa, all these great saints and avatars, they live it. They live it. They, they really are dependent on spirit for everything. And I think the birds are a great <coughs> example, how happy they are, how they sing all the time. And they're not thinking about, you know, what's going to happen in the future or what happened in the past. They're very, very present. And, and animals are very, very present oftentimes too, and they're great teachers that way. They're just yeah. like, like I mentioned my, my dog, Mohandas K. Gandhi. <laughs> Mo was teaching me when I was in grad school to, to like, relax, don't, don't stress out about exams and all these things, it's not worth it. So I think that really came through because there came a point with all those things, the car was guided to be sold, the house, the cursing with all her journaling, and working with Jesus, Jesus was very specific. It's time to let go of the car, it's time to let go of the house. He, he not only starts it off with a question like, where are you withholding? Because that's the tip of the iceberg. And then you get underneath to what's underneath. Where am I holding on to past ego beliefs? And he's got a whole workbook for that. <laughs> Some of you might have seen Lesson 50, I am sustained by the love of God. He says, you believe in this world, you're sustained by everything but the love of God. Pills, money, clothing, knowing the right people, being liked. You know, he rattles them off. Psychological defenses, investments, he goes after it. And then in Lesson 76, the laws of medicine, the laws of economics, mm -hmm. the laws of, of friendship. Friendship! I'm guarding against God's love by my friendship? Yes, as long as you have your preferences and you treat some of the sonship as more important than the rest of the sonship. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You're holding off from my agape unconditional love by your friendships even. The ego's use of friendship is the block to the awareness of love. So Jesus is the way shower. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the master and he will work directly with the mind when you're really ready. And 
And Kirsten's life is, is a great example of that, a very transparent example, because when she would get to the point of selling the car, you know, there would be the voices of the world. Maybe her father, biological father, uh, saying something like, are you sure? Where is this heading? What happened to my young, beautiful daughter who had such a life ahead and was going to live in a ski town? And, and, then, and then imagine when she got the guidance from Jesus in journaling to sell the house. <laughs> sell your house? And what are you into? Jesus? You know, it's like you can only imagine. They weren't a religious family, you know, in terms of Jesus. Jesus first appeared to her in a meditation and said, I will be your teacher. But she had no conditioning there in living there in rural New Zealand. No, no conditioning from the Judeo-Christian world about Jesus at all. He appeared the first time there. In fact, she didn't even know what Jesus looked like until she, uh, there was a picture of G Jesus uh, in a, a drawing in one of the drawers that she was digging through and she got it and she went to her mother and she said, who is this? When I was 15. When she was 15, she said to her mother, who is this? And Jackie said, oh my God, it's Jesus. Person didn't know about Jesus. Like Francis not knowing about the Beatles. <laughs> Person didn't know about Jesus. And so, this makes the parable of her life a very good teaching parable. Like the Course in Miracles, the, the scribe and the collaborator, Helen Schuckman and Bill, they're research psychologists. What better way to send A Course in Miracles through than through an atheist research professor <laughs> exactly. who wasn't even Christian. In fact, if you look at the whole team that Jesus used, Jewish. they're Jewish. He, he had a home team, the homeboys, <laughs> or homeboys and girls are there. He's not using Christians yeah. to deliver the message of Christ. He's using Jews <laughs> instead. And a transgender man to finance. Yes. The publishing of his book, Transgender, from Mexico. Now, this is, that starts to give us a little clue about Christ. He's not buying into anything of time and space. Wasn't Bill gay? Bill at times, yeah. yeah. He's, he, he's gay and heterosexual, and I think by the end yeah. of his life he was yeah. more asexual. Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, not mm -hmm. Bill. Bill. Uh, Helen's, uh, yeah. So, you can see the value of this, that that the Spirit has to find a way to use the symbols to kind of almost catch your mind off guard in the most surprising way, because if you think you know what's coming, egoically, you will defend against the light. You will say, no, not for me, no, 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 you'll block it. So the Spirit's got to find a way to come in through the, the back door. And, and that's what this book's about, and that's what our life's about, because eventually she did let go of the stashes, she did let go of everything. We have lived in divine providence, and, and after the book it kind of hints that there's more to come, but I've been here before and we've shared many times, there's, there's a lot of people that are taking our example and saying, I'm going to try this out as, as like a calling. And, and even Zach, you know, you, I think when I met you, you had a, a day job. <laughs> and now, you're the director of, of the Peaceful Ninjas, and this is the headquarters. We're in the headquarters now, of the Peaceful Ninjas, and it's taking off and doing things, and yet it's still like a mind watcher. You know, it, like you were saying, it can be a major mind watcher, and still, Jesus is behind all of it, you know, prompting here. Here, his, this is next, and this is next. You can feel it's more of a step-by-step, piece-by-piece unwinding of a very tricky ego, really. I have a question. Uh, so, people in the Unity community, all their personal funds go into the slash funds? The ones we, we call messengers of peace, there, there were those that felt like a calling and a dedication, like they were dedicating their life, and they were dropping their plan B's, all plan B's. And so, yeah, that's been the case with that. Now, there's been, I mean, it's a, it's a big plan and there's, Kirsten and I have, have interacted with thousands and probably tens of thousands of people over the, all these years, 
And everybody, you know, it's highly individualized, so that's, that's not really something that, that we have an emphasis on at all. Um, it seemed like, for me, it was extremely important. Like, for me to answer my call and kind of go all the way with it, it was very important. And then for those that were coming in, um, I never anticipated that. I never anticipated, like, communities or, I didn't grow up as a child thinking, I can't wait, mom and dad, I want to live in a spiritual community when I grow up. We didn't even know, I don't think I even know they existed. I was white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, yeah. in a yeah. suburban Protestant church, and, you know, if somebody said, what do you think? You think you'll live in a community when you get older? I'd say, what's that? Like, is that like a neighborhood or, yeah. you know, I, I, I didn't have any context whatsoever for that. None of us did, actually. And so, each of us, when we got this deep call, we had to face all kinds of resistances. Like, is this how I want to, where is this going? And how am I going to spend my life? And how's this going to look? And all the typical things that anyone would ask. We were like, going through that. And, and now I think we have, we have maybe 20 some people that kind of are part of a, a community around the world. But then there's also, so many people that are supporting hosting. It's like right here. We're back here in yeah. this house by invitation and you're in our hearts, you're as much of our community yeah. as anybody else. You know, we feel this deep love, we feel this deep welcome. And and we know too that everybody is is being unwound from the ego, so everybody's taking their steps as they're guided to do. Oftentimes we join with people, we pray with people we listen with people and, and have these kind of informal joinings and talk, but, but it's like I was saying earlier, it's, it's Christ is in charge from a much broader perspective, way beyond anything that a human being could yeah. ever comprehend. So we're just staying in the joy of that. As long as you're happy, gleeful, joyful, free-flowing and everything, then you're, at this moment, you're, you're in, in God's plan, right now. It's not a future kind of thing at all, it's like a, a real present mm -hmm. feeling. Yeah, it's very individualized. I think it's, and it's also about learning stewardship. For everyone, it's the journey of learning stewardship, like to give over personal ownership to the Holy Spirit of our entire life. And so money is just one aspect of it, you know, like our time, our voice, our body, our everything including all of the resources, forms, yeah. things that we have. And so it's about just being willing. As soon as you're aware you can do that, you can do it immediately now. <laughs> you can give it. And, and that's just basically you're saying, I don't want to have guilt. I want to join in the decision-making so that everything that I have is being used in the best possible way to serve your plan so I won't be giving away money out of guilt, which is quite a common thing when you start to go on the journey. The first, it was so funny when I, I knew I was coming over to join with David. As soon as my house was selling, my perception of my parents shifted. Suddenly they were old, and I wanted to give them money. <laughs> like, just like that. And thank God, I told them, and they burst into laughter. <laughs> They're like, What? You want to give us money? You think we're old? That's ridiculous. We want to give you money. <laughs> you know. But it was just to see that in my mind. Like I, I even the guilt of giving over to God, you know, it's it's easier to want to kind of use it to keep looking after the world or looking after those who don't have it. So I think that's part of the prayer is taking the steps and wanting to steward for God. And then yeah, in, in our community it's it's then there are many in the community now who are on full scholarship because they've come over the years and they've, they've given all that they've had and then they reach a point where they don't have, for some of them, they came with $10,000 or $30,000 or kind of used those funds and used those resources and, and their life is so merged in this purpose that now they're just there on scholarship. And then others come with funds and they can contribute a monthly amount and that's enough to cover for everyone. So it's like the spirit really 
is orchestrating all of it for for this whole beautiful plan. But yeah, it's, there isn't really a cookie cutter approach with any of it. So it's fun to watch people too. They come and they get so devoted, and they their eyes start to get really glowy and sparkly, and and they it's like we get to watch modern day like. St. Francis is coming to us that, that are so devoted, they become telepathic, they become prayerful, they, they become, you know how Mother Teresa always emphasized a life of service and devotion. We get to watch that, we get to watch the people come, their faces light up, they're carefree, they're patient. Uh, we were just talking with Jeffrey this morning because there's a couple in the community and Jeffrey's been filming and you know keeping footage on hard drives and doing some of that and this and this and he was talking about a couple people in the community that he could even say well I, I lost the hard drive or you know of, of all the footage and they would go okay well let's 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 pray on that or let's take a look and <laughs> see what's next you know and he was like whoa you know th th there was no sense of of something gone wrong or loss in the thing and and so those experiences, those are the miracles. The miracle accepts, the miracle is gracious, the miracle is abundant, the miracle overlooks error. The miracle doesn't first go, well, here's the problem, now let's dissect it and see who's to blame and da da da. It, the miracle way above that, it overlooks, it doesn't even see the error. It looks right at the atonement without even seeing the error. Now that's when you get into that, the joy of overlooking errors. You know, none of us were raised, how do, how do we overlook errors? We were raised to see the error, diagnose the error. Establish guilt. Maybe. Establish guilt. Who's to blame? Who's responsible? What is yeah. the legal profession? You know, yeah. I mean, if you look at it all the way down the line, it's, it's really, it's guilt-based. And then the miracle just, whoa, it overlooks it entirely. And that's why when you see people, sometimes you see children, you see animals, you see some people that are so joyous, they look like they're ready to just burst out of their skin, they're so happy. They, are, they don't have those thoughts going on. They're not analyzing, they're not trying to figure something out. They're just into love. They're, those are dogs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why people oftentimes have, have a relationship, a deeper relationship with their dog than any of their partners. Because there's this deep bond and connection and love that's there. And so, but what we're about really to is, is about, we're about living the Course. You know, the Course is a big book, it can be certainly studied and, and it can be, you can do workshops and seminars and write lots of books and this and this, but, but it's never been the goal. Our goal has been to have an actual living experience of what the words are pointing for, not getting stuck in the words or splitting hairs around words and concepts, you know, it just seems like that's the, the nature of the world. The ego is always trying to find things to divide on. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean, I go out and I give a talk or something and they'll, they'll be like, define God. And I'll be like, oh, sure. define God? God can't be defined. I'm happy to report <laughs> that. God has no definition. Even the word is just a word, you know, it's, it's so far out. Thank you, Kate. It's so far beyond any kind of word or concept. And I, and I love it when people are doing that. It was the same with the Beatles, too. I mean, I was watching that movie eight days a week, and they just landed in the United States, and one of the press of America were like, who do you people think you are? Elvis Presley? And right away Ringo and another, they start squirming around and throwing their hips around. No, 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 I'm not Elvis, you know. They, they would take whatever was fired at them and play turn it, play with it, turn it into an instant joke. Yeah. Even wiggling their bodies like, you know, you got to love it. You know, now that you know is spirit. You know there's God. <laughs> when people are firing things at them and they are having an absolute ball with it. And imagine if you were a teenager at that era. I mean, we're, remember, we're just coming out of the 50s in America, into the 60s, early 60s. They come over. The teenager has the, there's authority issues, there's 
issues with the system, there's this, you know how it is, we've all gone through being a teenager, we're like wondering, what the heck, and how did I end up on this planet, and who are these people, <laughs> and who are these parents, my God, you know, and we relate more to the Buddha there than, than we actually do to parents, but we, we actually are at a very tenuous point of our life, and imagine the Beatles come along, yeah. and you watch on TV and you go, no wonder the teenage girls screamed. They were hearing love songs. That more than that, they were watching them at the press conferences. They were like, brazen, bold. These are like people wanting to put them under the microscope and they're having a ball with it. They're even making their, their manager. Brian Epstein is squirming because he's the guy trying to shape the image of the Beatles and they don't even care about the image. He's squirming, they're not squirming. You know, now that means there's a God, because there's something being activated, imagine, in all those teenagers. I saw them at Dodger Stadium, so I was in the middle of being there, and it was, I had, I was so in love with Paul McCartney, I had to take, I had to take Beatlemania pills, or these little candy pills, and I was like, one every four hours, and I had, so yeah, I, you know, yeah. I had a little air pack, yes. I, had, I was just completely in love with it. Yes, them. and Sigourney Weaver's in the movie, she was a little... As a girl, she was like, the Beatles are coming, and to the Hollywood Bowl, so she was like, so she spent like the whole day, like straightening her hair out, like with special kind of cans, and yes, you know, to do everything, just because John would be at the concert. You and, the same air they were breathing. And, right, and just for chance, out of 50,000 girls, John might see Sigourney. <laughs> so, you know, she's in the movie too, you know, that's the fun part of it. People will, will go through so much, but their love was being activated, mm -hmm. their cool. heart was being activated, wow. and that's precious. And that's what I think we're all here for. I think, just like the Beatles were, we have a purpose here, is to activate that love, to share it, to shine it, to be bold even, mm -hmm. to be brazen. We don't have to hide our light, there's nothing holding us back. There's, that's the message, there's nothing real, it's just beliefs and thoughts that are doubt thoughts in the mind. But there's nothing real, there's no real barriers. Mm -hmm. We can have extraordinary lives, extraordinary lives, and, and there's nothing to stop us. Not a thing to stop us from having an extraordinary life. Good to know. May I, um, playing off of that story, for an example, a woman who's very um, fanatical about, let's say, John Lennon or whoever, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. And she's just very fanatical. Um, and so she has this whole fantasy playing about who this person is. She may even see him as this enlightened being. And then she comes up, you know, she's, she's obviously very um, ignited with passion and love through the thought and the fantasy of this person. But then when she actually comes into contact with him, maybe he's not um, what she's foreseen what she's projected onto him <coughs> as being this enlightened, sweet thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And what is, in, re in regards to the Chorus, um, I guess, would that be considered desire, attachment, that that woman once had for that <coughs> being, was pro projecting it onto the person, and um, but yet it, it elevated her state of being into such a divine space of love and grace and um, receptivity to that. Um, I don't know. Can you just maybe enlighten us on a situation like that? Like, is it ego-driven or is that spirit-driven? Yeah, the, the, the ego projected the whole cosmos. So, so everything of form, even all books, even the Course book itself, I mean, everything of form is, is a projection of, of the ego. And the word that the Course uses for this is specialness. So, is, it's a sense of what you're describing is, would be a form of what the Bible might call idolatry. You know, have no graven images before the Lord thy God, like a commandment. It, and so, she just asked the question of like someone who's drawn to, like a Paul McCartney or John Lennon, and there's a fantasy going on, they're, they're seeing something, they're elevated, they're passionate, they feel swirls of love, there's, they're activated with energy, and they've come alive, but what's the aspect 
of, of the ego, what's the dangerous aspect mm -hmm. in there like that. And that's, that really comes to that point of like, that's why the prayer of the heart has to be like with Kirsten's, show me a love that will never end. You know, coming back to the purity of the prayer. Because the, the spirit can use anything in form and to, to lift the mind, to start to feeling more inspiration. But, but even when, when there's an activation of strong energy, a euphoria, like there were these teenage girls screaming, there, there is a helpful aspect towards that activation and then there is a purification that will be necessary to handle where this is really going. Mm -hmm. And that purification has to be at the top priority of everything. Because it's so easy for the ego to hijack things, what seem to be like fantasies, and just take them and turn them into long detours. Like long, long, long detours. Lifetime detours we're talking about. We've got so many movies in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, but one of them that Kirsten and I know really enjoys is the one with Jane Seymour and Christopher Reeves, Somewhere in Time. An amazing kind of classic movie of, there's, there's definitely some fantasy components to it, but there's also like this deep burning desire for love, a, a non-ending love in that movie. And, and as Kirsten shared, she, had, she and Jackie had had all those past life regressions, so she, was, she kind of had more of a, a broad view of, of, wow, deep love and then tragic ending. Deep love, tragic ending. Sounds like a formula for books. <laughs> Deep love, tragic ending. And then, after a series of lifetimes with that, then there's got to be more than deep love, tragic ending. Is that even love, if it can end? Is a good question. Some of you know how I love that movie, Solaris, with, uh, with George Clooney. Yeah. We don't have to live like this anymore. Yeah, and the Dylan Thomas <laughs> poem that's in there, though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Whew, huge lyrics, that's the poem that rumbles through Solaris, taking us on to, towards an eternal relationship that's beyond romantic, that's beyond time and space. And, and then we, we talk about the divine law and giving and receiving and, and as they come closer to Solaris, all their unconscious fears and doubts are manifested immediately into these characters. And then they have to forgive in order to merge with the light that's there in Solaris. So, so I would say the purity is, has to be there and also that, that fantasy is made by the ego. So the ego fantasizes and, and sometimes like when we were growing up in university, we studied courses like in mythology, ancient mythology. Well, Jesus is saying that all of time and space is mythology. There, it's all mythology, 100% mythology. Whoa, okay, that's a, whole, that's a mind bender. And then you could say that the whole world, as we're judging it in terms of linear, it's the whole world is fantasy. So what's the answer then? How, what's the purposeful use of fantasy? It's the spirit's use of fantasy to take you out of fantasy. Spirit's use of time to take you out of the belief in time. You see, thank God there's the presence of love that's still in us that can use anything that the ego made to turn it around and retranslate it to a happy dream, to a forgiven world. And, and specifically relationships. I think when I do these talks around on the course all over the world, a lot of times people, they read the course and then they read those, it's like nine chapters from 15 to 24, which are about special relationships, and they call them special love relationships and special hate relationships that block you from the kingdom of heaven. And so they'll make a pronouncement like, I'm through with relationship. I will never have another relationship. But what happens is that's also blocking the Holy Spirit from using what the mind believes in to, to free the mind. Mm -hmm. So you see how important it is, is the purpose. Mm -hmm. And there's a great section called the healed relationship too where 
you invite the Holy Spirit into the relationship and then it gets really disjunctive and it gets really difficult after the Holy Spirit is invited in. And then Jesus says, the ego will tell you, get rid of him. <laughs> Here, not this, now. Jesus says, like, you invited the Holy Spirit in to purify this relationship and the ego wants him out wow. right away. Wow. Like, when the first sign of difficulty arises, you are out, and the Spirit's like saying, no, no, you invited the Spirit in, let the Holy Spirit work with it. And that's one of the best sections I've ever read in any spiritual text about, about really giving relationships over in a very deeply purposeful way to, to you might say, the inspired use of fantasy is what it really is. The Beatles were kind of used in that way, I think, a lot. For many, they had a lot of disillusionment, too. But it was, for many, it was their first heart opening that, oh my God, there's something real to love. There's some real aspect to love. I think I went through that, that phase of idolizing my husband to, before we got married. Um, the point where I didn't really want to spend any time with him. I just wanted to think of him. <laughs> and my friend said, my friend said, well then you don't really need to like be with him. All you need is like this big cardboard image of him to like worship. Because <laughs> it because it was um I was seeing the purest in him. And then even after we got married, I didn't live with him for a year. And I felt the Spirit um, actually guided us to get married, but not live together yet. Because <laughs> I just was working on my own issues, and then, and then I started to feel like the move was to then move in with Him. And um, I have invited the Holy Spirit to help, and I think I'm at that phase now where the ego is saying, let's just break this up. How about some, how about divorce? So that's really good to hear you say that because it's like hang in there longer, let the spirit work, let the mm. spirit finish what it started. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a movie called The Fountain, which is all about awakening and transcendence and the wife is, is dying and the <coughs> husband is desperately trying to come up with a scientific cure. But they're both on a spiritual journey to enlightenment and awakening and she'll just kind of whisper to him over throughout the movie, you know, finish it, finish it. Mm -hmm. Which is really, like with the ego, finish it, you know. The Spirit's so much urging us to, to be finished with these games this running away, this fear of love, fear of deep intimacy. So it's almost like when you start to feel like opportunities for intimacy coming into your life, like really heart swirling, heart opening intimacy, you know, just pay attention when those opportunities come. Almost like ready, be ready to leap through the, the keyhole. You know, or have Jesus reach a hand through and say, come on, you, here I am, come now. Mm -hmm. Like the Truman Show, some of you remember the Truman Show, it's mm -hmm. all contrived. Mm -hmm. Meryl's playing a fake wife, the, even the best friend's playing yeah. a fake mm -hmm. best friend. There's Christoph who's doing the whole show for money and product, selling products and the whole, it's all superficial, it's all fake and then whoosh comes into Crashing the set is Sylvia. She's like our Christ figure. She loves him beyond the Truman Show. She wants him free of the Truman Show. She wants him with no limits. She wants him to know who he truly is and pure. And she's like crashing the set. And when she first crashes the set, you know, I think in the movie, um, he's basically at a library and she's, she's got this sweater. He notices her sweater and he's seen a glimpse of her before. She's right there at the library, in the stall, right opposite him. He recognizes her sweater, and he looks, and she's wearing a pin. How will it end? 
She's already into the Christ's energy and finish it. Like I want you free of this show, show of images. I want you free as your creator created you. How will it end? And then he notices that and, and he starts to relate with her and, and he's trying to maybe get a date with her and she basically writes out, I think with a pencil on a, on a little piece of paper, if we don't go now, it won't happen. Again, the Christ, like, we have to go now. It's the only time we can escape time is now. If we don't go now, it won't happen. And that's, the ego always wants to even have future enlightenment, future self-realization, future devotion, and now I've got to deal with all these practical struggles. And the Christ energy is like, no, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right now. It's closer than your palm. It's closer than your breath. It's right now. And, and then he goes for it. He, he takes her hand and they literally scoot out and get out of the, the library and go racing down to the beach. Just laughing and just screaming in happiness like the Beatles fans. They're screaming as they go down. And they're, they're so gleeful, they're so joyful at everything. And She's like talking to him and, and he says something like, why, why speak? And then they kiss, they go right past the talking, <laughs> they go right into running down there and kissing and then they have such passionate kisses, it's like they're kissing for, towards all eternity. It's very powerful, very powerful, very powerful and then you hear the truck or the vehicle coming because <laughs> they know that they've got off <laughs> out, outside of the, the show where the cameras aren't. They're yeah. out beyond the cameras, and they're coming down to, to get them, to get her, and, and then she's like, I, there's no time, I've got to tell you, you know, it's all, she reaches down in the sand, it's all fake, it's all for you. She does, in her best non-duality speech, <laughs> in, in like 30 seconds, like, it's, it's all, none of it's real, they're all actors, it's all for you, they're just acting for you, you know, she just splurts it all out, and he's just like, what, what? And then, and then, as he, she's being grabbed by this man, who's pretending to be her father, she says to Truman, you know, come and find me, come and find me. You know, that's what Jesus is, the Christ is saying to us, come and find me, come and find me. How powerful that is, how precious. And then, off she goes, and all he knows is the, the guy, the man who's playing the father says, we're moving away, don't even try. She's crazy, her, she does this to all of her boyfriends. <laughs> da, 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 da. It's the ego desperately yeah. trying to oh, yeah. explain away the Christ, and then he says, oh, we're, we're moving to Fiji. And so he, that's Sylvia's, that's why he wants, so to, go to, why he wants to go to Fiji, yeah. because he feels this love, this yeah. deep, not of this world love. He'll go to the end of the earth, he'll go all the way around to the opposite side of the earth to find Sylvia. And truth. And truth, and Sylvia is the Christ when he finally does get out of the Truman Show and he pushes his way out the exit door, she comes racing down to find him. And that's, isn't that like the prodigal son story? Yeah. Where the oh, father yeah. comes racing, mm -hmm. racing out to find the son who's squandered, the, thinks he's lost his inheritance. The father kills the calf, has a big party and a celebration. So the Truman Show is like a, a modern day parable of find it. Find the truth. And really that's what Kirsten and I, we do, we're, it's not just only the presence, but it's, it's the presence inviting, inviting, igniting within you to say, wow, this is like a holographic world, this is a, a quantum world and, and why should I put any limits on my self realization desire, my self-realization quest. Here we are, surrounded again by the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Buddha, what a symbol of devotion to one thing, a single-pointed desire and devotion. That is what ignites everything. Even reminded me when I came here that time and when Priya was just devastated about breaking up and then we just were joined throughout the whole weekend and that was really touching for me to see that by the end of the weekend she had a smile on her face, 
she was totally linked in and resonating with what was being shared as the possibilities and she was, I could feel her, she was willing to let go of the devastation in a weekend, yeah. in a weekend. Whereas you, you know how it goes in this world, the ego will do such a number oh, yeah. on your mind, it can make those things last for days, weeks, months, years, decades. The ego is such a, a master deceiver at trying to perpetuate the belief in loss and devastation and I'll never have that again and I'll never see, you know, it just goes in there and it just plays that tune so strong. Yeah. And that's the way the book ends too with, with, with the sense of coming home to a, a relationship with God and then in that deep meditative connection with God, everything is given. If there's, if you're supposed to speak, if you're supposed to travel, if you're supposed to meet somebody, if you're supposed to be with somebody, everything is given in that connection. There's not this grinding thing in the mind going, what now and what do I do and you know, we know how that, that is, it's like a tumbler, it's like a committee in there. Yeah. It's like the, the committee is meeting, like, how many of you are in there? And why can't you make a decision? Why are we stuck on this stupid. point or that point? Stuck on stupid. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about, um, I'm not exactly sure how to frame it, but uh, call it boundaries or or being able to distinguish between... Okay, so, just yesterday I had, I had a completed uh, uh, an intimate relationship that I had with a partner. Um, and it really does feel like spirit really brought us together to play. And we did. And we could continue to... There's like a really deep connection to the point where we've had many, multiple experiences of being just one body, one person, really just enmeshed in one, and it's felt amazing. It's been a really beautiful process. Um, at the same time, um, <coughs> at the same time, I, well, I found myself either, you know, at times activating the past, or playing in the future and kind of rejecting or not fully receiving all the love sometimes. Um, and sometimes I, it wasn't, it didn't feel like love, it felt more like projection of trauma onto me. She's, she's gone through some really heavy stuff in her life. And I did my best, I feel like I did a fairly good job as in, you know, for a male to just witness and you know, I actually thought of you a bunch of times when the way you say okay I would just say okay here we are no matter what's going on and um, so it, but it but it's gone on for for so long and there hasn't really been a shift with that and so I felt like I felt like I need to kind of draw a boundary and kind of separate myself from her. Um, so, so my question is, well, before I get to the question, so I just want to reiterate that the love that's shared really is, like, it really does feel very pure and childlike and beautiful and, and divine. Um, so there's that. So my question is, what about all this other stuff? And where do I, how do I draw that? Well, I already did draw the boundary. I'm, I guess I'm in, I'm reactivating the, the bass and thinking like, did I do the right thing? Did I not do the right thing? Like, should I go outside right now and call her and say sorry? Like, let's be together again. Or all this stuff, all these what ifs. Like, what if it's just a dark phase? She's bringing up all these past traumas in order to release it so that we can like move on. It's all these what ifs. My question is, where, where, 
where, where, where can we decipher, distinguish between like, something that's just being projected onto us and deciding, like, well, I don't need that in my life versus it's all a part of it. There is none else besides him anyway. So I, um, I maybe I, I need to, I need to deal, or I need to be in this ocean with, with this person and all the stuff that she's gone through. Because I haven't gone through. She has. It's been projected onto me. So do I need to take a look at it too, or, or not? So it's it's kind of been, I think because of our like deep connection, it's it's kind of gotten muddy for me. Like what what do I need to look at? What do I not need to look at? So it's it's been really interesting. Yeah, it's it's such a beautiful question because I think we both can speak to that in terms of almost like you could almost call it like the evolution of of the construct of relationship because there seems to be like an evolution and a purification that you're aware of that's going on, that you're part of a much bigger purification and there's like an evolution. But even within the context of relationships, there are certain, certain time out contexts where it's, it's like time out here, and we need to pause, we need to step back, or there can be even aspects of the relationship that are guided in certain ways. Because um, we both have experienced that through our relationship and through relationships of there's a time for stepping back. There's like an ebb and flow, just like with the tides. There's an ebb and flow. And you just really need, when the ebb's coming in, you have to really go with the ebb. When the flow comes in, like the tides, you, you can feel it, like something very deep, and you go with that. And, and always such open communication of just sharing the thoughts, like this isn't personal, and it's nothing you've said or done. It's just this adult, a strong feeling coming up and I have to be true to this feeling. We've seen those nuances throughout our relationship and also through different relationships and, and um, yeah, I guess we could kind of speak to that. I, I know it, you feel the same thing, you've been through the same thing with, with relationships and, and through went through a, 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 an actual marriage, a legal marriage, and there was so many lessons. After all of this, uh, we were at the Peace House and Jason came out from Canada and Kirsten, Kirsten was in the hot tub, um, meditating in the hot tub, and Jason hopped in the hot tub with her, and Kirsten heard, he's got a ring. She heard the Holy Spirit say, in her mind, he's got a ring and he's he's going to give you a ring, he's going to propose. So it's imagine having being in a hot tub and having the spirit like saying, Here here's what's coming next in terms of a ring and then he wasn't he playing with it. He took I had the ring you had the ring from our relationship, but I'd moved it onto my other finger, whichever one is not married. The right, in this culture, I think it's the right. So it was then on my right hand, and it had been there for probably a year. And then when we were in the hot tub, and Jason took the, the ring, and he was, and I heard he's going to put it on my other hand, like symbolically, that propose. would be in, yeah, to propose. So he was playing with it. Wow. And then he was playing with it for the longest time, and I'm like, I know what's going to happen. Maybe I should just tell him. <laughs> do your thing. What you do, do quickly. Because <laughs> he was all scared. Oh, yeah. And he did. But yeah, I've, in my experience, it's there has to be that feeling of purpose, and that you can you can feel there's a healing value and a purpose, and we're both in it together. Mm. And when that's there, even if there's trauma, projection, darkness, whatever, you can feel in your heart, like this is definitely what we're both to be doing together. You know? And there's aspects of the relationship that are that, are really like going through the healing. And also, I would say in every relationship that's serving the Holy Spirit's purpose, there's also going to be extension. You're, there's going to be some shining of the light together. And that's really important. 
because when you have that in a relationship, then you get to witness to each other who you really are and the potential that you have. And that continues to support you to remember who each other are so that when the darkness then comes up, you've got a reference point of truth. So if you come into phases where it feels like you've done all of this work and it's another loop and it feels like a repeat and it's like, oh, there's no healing value in this. I can't give my heart to it or there's not any juice in it, it starts to feel old, you know, or it starts to feel like, whoa, this is actually distracting me from being able to really be fully you know, helpful and of service, then it could be that it's helpful to just kind of step away from some, some part of it to, to be able to be clear again, to, to come back. So that's been my experience of it. And, and what I found with, um, yeah, like in each of these relationship assignments I've had, the focus has always been on that we, we have a purpose together, you know, we have, a, we have a mission, we have a purpose. And then within that, all the healing will come up. But it's like the two of you are aligned, and then you're alongside each other, and then whatever comes up within your relationship, you can handle it. When the focus starts to go like that, <laughs> it's a very yeah. different experience. It goes from being this vertical alignment with healing to horizontal or personal. And when it starts to get about trying to fix each other, help each other, the projection is really personal, interpersonal, then, yeah, it's impossible. So sometimes it is like, let's step back and get back into remembering what this is for. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and think of like Khalil Gibran in the Book of Prophet. Mm. He talks about marriage. He talks about the pillars of the temple. You know, they, they need to have some space between the pillars. If the pillars are too close, that's not going to be the strength to hold the structure. There needs to be a spacing. Any architect knows there has to be spacing. And, and the way I interpret that is, if you're in a relationship <coughs> serving the Holy Spirit and serving God and serving Spirit, there has to be this sense of joy, this glee, this sense of freedom, this sense of spaciousness, mm -hmm. not a sense of suffocation, not a sense of, of clinginess. You know, we, we know yeah. how the ego feels, where there's like, like senses of dependency, like, I need you, I can't live without you, and this and this. That's why we, we have these movies like Fatal Attraction, or we have these crazy triangle movies where it's like, ooh, bizarre, you know. So it's, it turns from special love, intense attraction and dependency into special hate, you know. Glenn Close or something, you know, it's like, ah, you know, it's, it's but we, we've learned enough from those things that that there has to be a sense of spaciousness. And so to me, what is that spaciousness but, oh, I am responsible for what I see, I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. It's like total 100% responsibility for state of mind. Now that's going to generate some love and some spaciousness. And then, as Kirsten's saying, there has to be this kind of, almost like a collaboration vibe and energy where we're here to serve the light. We're here to shine our light. Now think of that in terms of a relationship. If, if all of us have perceived interpersonal relationships that were codependent, angry, fighting, conflict, projecting, even what would be perceived as ph emotional, physical, violence, you know, we've got plenty of evidence like that. Now, how important is it to have a witness of something that's not any of that? That's gentle, that's kind, that's respectful, that's loving, that where there's high communication, deep communication, how precious that is. And even to be called, Jesus says, it's not that you are to be without your specialness, it's that you 
have to let the Holy Spirit use it as a witness and an example. So the goal of the Course is, is taking us towards peace of mind, but Jesus is like saying the context of relationships is, listen, don't think you're just going to wiggle your nose or click your fingers or click your heels. I'm not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. And Zappo, you know, there are very, very, very rare experiences like Eckhart Tolle's experience on the park bench where there's a, in a, in a very short element of what seems to be time, there's a radical transformation of consciousness and then comes out of it is, he was so disoriented he, he basically couldn't function. It was so altering, mind altering, and then it took him a long time to kind of adapt and adjust before he could even speak about it. Those are very rare. And what we're speaking about is coming back to that feeling of how, how are we being used together and how can we serve together and, and even how can skills and abilities be used in a, like a complementary way to be a witness for a love that's not of this world. And there's a feeling with that. And so I wouldn't say it's necessarily, I don't think Kirsten and I, we never, we never had any discussion in, all, in those years about boundaries. There was no setting of boundaries, but it was always about guidance, like prayerfully joining together. What do you feel? What are you feeling now? What do you think? Taking a trip, we're feeling, oh, it might be time to turn, move off the highway. What are you feeling now? You know, when your heart is so open, then it's like, you're not trying to lead or follow mm -hmm. a partner, you're just saying, wow, let's tune in together mm -hmm. and let's be very intuitive with our decisions. Yeah. So let's let the Spirit show us, mm -hmm. make it obvious, make the way, let us feel it, let us give us signs and symbols, mm -hmm. make it so obvious that we can't mess it up. And we have, there was just lots of those. There, some of them are in the book and there's just many that aren't. That, where, where it was such a devotion to be used by Spirit, and then you show the way. And we prayed through things. And there was a lot of, of kind of, um, I mean, Kirsten came in to the United States on a, um, an ESTA visa, um, which people, some of you know, it's like if you come from another country that has that, with the United States has that agreement, it's a, it's a three month, 90 day visa. And so, she came over to answer the call, to help me out at the Peace House, but then all of a sudden it started to get deeper, like there was a deeper purpose. But then the 90 days were up pretty quick. And then off we were, I think we went to, was it South America? Argentina. Argentina, and so on and so forth. So that was one big thing where we had to be very prayerful on, and we really didn't know what was going to happen when we came back. I think that's in your book where you, she has an encounter with the, the immigration officer or whatever, and she's not sure, but she's gleefully sharing all of her miracles with the immigration officer. <laughs> and I asked if he could extend my visa waiver, and he said, no, you can't. That it's not a visa, so you can't extend it. And then he said, what are you doing? So I told him all about it, and I said, I'm serving God, and I had a head injury, and I'm healing, and I'm so happy, and I just want to keep like healing, and traveling around, and practicing forgiveness. And he said, oh wow, well I can't extend it, but I can give you another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And then there was another time when, I'm just like a traveling mystic, but the church symbol came in just to be used for what's called an R1 visa, which is a religious visa, and uh, interestingly enough, there's the whole story, miraculous story of, of even how she got that, but but that was for our nonprofit, the Foundation for the Awakening Mind. So it's a religious visa for a nonprofit foundation for the Awakening Mind, and it miraculously came through, but then after two and a half years, it was, it was, or not renewed, and so 
But that turned into another great opportunity for deepening trust because there were so many miracles that, that flooded in that made it obvious for Kirsten that she was to leave the United States and that she was perfectly cared for and she had a huge calling and a huge mission to extend and everything was perfectly orchestrated even when she seemed to have to leave the country. So those those things are all like telltale signs of, of a deepening devotion into purpose. And then it starts to get clear in the mind when, when you start to feel that, that, wow, this is, I have a huge calling and a huge purpose. And your prayer is like, you're in charge, what will serve? I'll do whatever, whatever serves. And that's when, like for me, the travels, there's been translators, I've gone to a lot of countries where I don't speak the language, the Spirit sends translators, or travel partners, and all kinds of things that help support the extension of the love and the joy and the happiness. But they're all seen in that way, they're all, they're, it's all being orchestrated by Spirit to serve a, a higher call. And that's so different from kind of the interpersonal way where, you know, there, there can be a lot of second guessing and yeah. doubts and should I have done more of this, or could I have been more kind, and could I have been more loving, you know, hypotheticals, the ego will really come in hard with those. And then the mind can really start spinning, and it gets hit with all these hypotheticals. Could have, could have, would have, should have. Wow, that's, talk about bringing the mind down, it's just like heavy weight that just sinks the mind deeper. But the more dedicated you are on purpose, and the more the dedication is so strong, it's almost like you develop true prayer. Yeah, and the mind is either extending or projecting. They are the only two kind of ac actions or activities of mind. So when you're serving the spirit, there's an extension. And when there isn't that service, then the mind will be projecting. And when there's interpersonal relationship, then that's where a lot of the projection happens. So it's, yeah, that's often what then the prayer just immediately can come to, well, what's the guidance then? Because the guidance will always realign the mind with how I can serve something higher than the self. I mean, there are times where there's some deeper healing taking place, but, yeah, in my experience, it's always been, that, you know, it's something you want to dive into, you know, in the moment. And yet, like you were sharing, there's still just such a responsibility that needs to be there. Otherwise there's no healing. Like if there's projection, there's no healing. Because part of the mind is still wanting to just not take responsibility and say the problem's out there. Yeah. And there's not, you can't do that for someone else. You can't possibly take responsibility or heal someone else. So sometimes the most you can do is say, I love you. I need to step away, you know, to even allow the spaciousness where wants to be seen. So. It's almost like, like the spirits mm -hmm. wanting to paint this beautiful picture and make this amazing expression of love. And and what you have to do is is be so open to let the supporting cast be sent in by by see by J C Central by mm -hmm. by spirit. Like, I basically traveled around the United States and Canada from like 1991 till probably about 2002, and then the international travels beyond Canada and the United States came with very strong symbols where like four business class airline tickets being donated, um, that was like, okay. Uh, and so suddenly I had three travel partners along with me with all expenses paid. You know, it was like dropped into my lap. I didn't even, I didn't even have a passport at that point. I was so unconcerned. Americans didn't need a passport to go oh, yeah. to Canada and I, I wasn't thinking overseas travel. I had not even a thought in my mind. I didn't have any wish list or vision boards or anything. I was just <laughs> happily and content in the moment. And then three travel mates and everything first class and everything paid to Argentina. Well that was like, let's, 
just like I was being sent to Argentina. I don't speak Spanish, uh, but the th three that went with me spoke a little bit of <coughs> Spanish, and everything was paid for, and then I was like, wow. And my one friend, Resta, was like, you've got a major problem. And I said, what is it? And said, you don't speak Spanish, and they don't speak English. That was her direct, you've got a major problem. I said, somehow I don't think it's going to be a problem. And when I went there, it wasn't arranged by me, but 14 translators showed up Whoa. for two weeks of gatherings. And even when the translators would get stuck on something, then the people would call out from the audience. It was like a group translation happening. It was like a Pentecost, and speaking in tongues and all kinds of things happening. And I was just like blown away because I was so out of my element, you know. I've never been to Argentina. That was going way beyond the element of anything that David knows. And the Spirit paid for a hectutiva, they call it, for business class executive class, and, and it was amazing. And then, all the travels and the years that uh, Kirsten and I have traveled, we've had translators show up, we've had travel companions, we've had mighty companion angels that are, you know, like, like Zach inviting us here to the house and your community inviting us in. Those things happened a lot, which is a lot of support. You know, it's a lot different than staying at Marriott and yeah. Holiday Inn and dealing with that, than going in a loving, welcoming environment where we love you, you're part of our family. You know, I know there are teachers that have burned out and felt like they went half crazy by going around and doing the, the hopping from hotel to hotel and bar to bar and the ego is just like waiting, I'll get you. Oh, you're going to speak for God? Well, let me see. I'll throw some temptations at you and I'll sink your boat faster than you think. Like, he goes like, you don't know what you're dealing with. I'll, because even uh, David Hawkins, who did, remember the kinesiology and everything, he would rate like books of authors with channel spirit and the book would be related, rated like, like at a 7 or an 8 and the author the scribe would be rated at 7 and 8, but then the book would get popular, the author would get paid, the author got famous, the author got pounded down to like a 3. The book is still at 7, but the ego got a hold of the scribe, the author, with all of the trappings of the world and just said, I'll just knock you back down, you're not going to God at all. It's that, it's that sneaky and it's that strong. So, what we experienced was, we were hosted, translators, also I noticed the phenomenon starting back around 1992 is I, the Spirit would send me travel companions that were singer-songwriters. Imagine yourself going out and speaking these ideas around the, the country, and then, and then just when you think, this is great, you get sent a travel companion who's a singer-songwriter, who receives song from the Spirit, brings the guitar along, starts singing, and the whole group starts swaying, and everyone drops into deeper meditations faster, and your heart's opening. And this is just a travel companion. And, and it just happens to be a, a talent, almost like a singer-songwriter, with a Joan Baez kind of voice, with an amazing uh, capabilities, who's hearing Jesus and who's hip receiving lyrics from Jesus with a Joan Baez voice. Okay, okay. You, I can see you're going to be directing my partnerships or my travel companions, or my translators, my everything else. You see how that starts to take it in a different trajectory because the Spirit can do more for you than you can do for yourself or by yourself. If it's for the whole. So, that was back in 1992, and I, don't, I can't even count how many, there was Don, Donna Marie Carey, there was Helena, you, there's with all these, Resta, I could just go through, and Ricky, that's five, Eric, Eric that's six, six, that I, this off the top of our heads, six, 
amazing singer-songwriters. Oh, and um, over in Europe, that amazing Course in Miracles singer. Um, Marie? Marie Maria? is another one. Maria? And I'm thinking of her. She just came along to the Holland Retreat. Oh, yeah. I'm not a travel partner, Mary. but... Yeah, she's, she's wanting to, to travel too, but yeah, that's like seven or eight. You know, the, they keep coming in, because why? Because you're, you're stronger together than apart. That, you know, many hands make for like work. You know, to have a singer-songwriter with amazing skills, and then and Kirsten herself, through prayer and devotion, learning the guitar, receiving songs, publishing albums, you know, all of that came and on tour. as well, and on tour. And this is from somebody who who didn't play the guitar. You were probably just as shocked as everybody. Yeah, she was surprised that the spirit just said, "Oh, we're going to turn you into one of these things." In fact, I've got four in mind now. For I've called them the Fed Four. I want to bring I have four friends of mine, Kirsten being one, who who sing and play the guitar, and I think they should all come together and form a band <laughs> with these fab four all women <laughs> this yeah. time like Ghostbusters let's do let's redo this yeah. thing and flip it around but but you can see from under that you can see where this is going like if you're if you really are sincere in your devotion that the spirit will send to you things that are complementary so there has to be that that kind of complementary wow we're doing this for the good of everyone that kind of a feel it comes in. And if that feel comes in, then then that's a way of being sure that it's really inspired by the Spirit. And there's no second guessing with that. I mean, it's so obvious. Like, it just lands. Yeah. I think the tricky thing for me is that, that that's, that's there, but it's all, in addition to all these other things as well, and that's what's been tripping me up. Just this wild very prayerful with it. Another question, um, kind of how to differentiate between guided vision and fantasy, because recently I experienced some pretty powerful breath work that I was receiving visions and I was not willing them to come through, so I think I just answered my own question, but then I came to the physical plane when I came out of my meditation and I'm so excited to like okay I already see what's unraveling here and, and I'm like excited to act on it and inspired and, but not all the pieces of that vision are maybe seeing the same thing or and that makes me wonder if I just like fantasized and like created it but maybe unknowingly and just had a discern our own personal desire versus the desired inspired will from the divine. Yeah, I think so. The, the tricky part that can sometimes come in is this thing of, of timing, because a lot of times we will have felt something or felt it pretty strong, and then it doesn't seem to come to pass, and then it's almost forgotten, and then one day we just look at each other and go, Oh my God! <laughs> this is it. You know yeah. where where you it shows you don't really have a really strong investment in it, but then you do still recognize it. It's not completely forgotten, and so we. I think the more relaxed you get and the more uh, kind of in the flow of it, then you become more intuitive and more telepathic. And then we would even have people come to our community, and. We would feel that Jesus and Holy Spirit was doing matchmaking. In fact, they would come together. When one would come, we and the other ones would start coming. We'd go, "Oh, here we go." <laughs> we'd have one that would be like very like strong-willed and strong-willed and proud and analytic and so on and so forth. And then we'd see another one coming in like a missile. And we said, "That that is a tough nut, but ooh, that is." That's going to crack that nut <laughs> right away. <laughs> and we, we can intuitively feel that happening. So we're just like all sitting there, it's like an adventure, watching the cats, you know, watching, 
The spirit views relationships to crack open the ego, to open the heart. You know, it's all for a greater purpose. Even the Beatles coming together, they were just four kids from Liverpool. And who knew? You know, they certainly didn't know. I don't think they had a clue, you know, for some years. And then all of a sudden it was this, oh my gosh, it was huge. And so we feel that. We feel that with our animals, our pets. We feel that with people. We can kind of intuitively feel these things. And we, we have, we pray, so we have sometimes strong feelings of certain things that are going to unfold and happen in particular countries or particular places. You know, it's like we start to have the strong feel, but we're so communicative. We're always talking, praying, you know, so open. That really helps make it more obvious. Because then you start getting the witnesses around like, huh, I was just, we get this look and we start like, are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> If we don't even have to have like a big discussion about it, because it's like, you know, we can feel things happening. So, in one sense, you know, it does take patience, like when, when something comes in really strong, but the pieces don't quite seem to be in place, and you don't even have an idea how those pieces could get in that place, and then you kind of like don't, hang on to like an investment with it, but then a lot of things will come around. Like, it's almost like a prophecy. So having no attachment to them, but still wanting to be a vessel that can help facilitate that calling that's coming through very strongly? Yes. Yeah, that combination of wanting to be used that strongly and that lack of investment <clears throat> in the outcome, I think those are two like really important things. Yes. Put them together. Yes. I mean, I just wanted to make a comment. Hi. Um, do I think what it's the voice because of the work I do, obviously. I think it's the voice. The voice of spirit for me is very calm and very matter of fact. There's no, there's no emotion. There's no, you know, thrills to it. The voice of, you know, what I'm saying, fantasy. There's there seems to be more of a feeling of emotion, and, and, and you feel it more, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It just, it's yeah. very, when I, my experience is it's very, it's just very simple, it's a very simple voice. Mm -hmm. that, that's my Simple experience. and matter of fact. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This simple voice said to me one day, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. there's this, there's this free, this is the truth, I, I have been, writing a book and I've got blocked. And um, and so, I don't know, on my Facebook, you know, I, I look at all the things about writing, right? And all of a sudden, this thing came into my Facebook, and it was this um, free one-day thing I could go to right here by Santa Monica and, um, and be with this gentleman. He's uh, Tap Your Writing Genius. His name is William Whitecloud. He's from uh, Australia, or, uh, South Africa. But he lived in Australia. But anyway, so I go there, right? And, oh, it's two days. It was two days. So I go there. First day, I'm loving it. Oh, this is exciting. Yes. <laughs> this is perfect for me. Blah, 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 blah. Then you get to the second day. <laughs> when they tell you it's going to cost you $5,000. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when they said that at the break at lunchtime, I just took my stuff and I left. This is emotion. So what she said, I did emotional. So I emotionally say, I can't stay here any longer. It's noontime and it's supposed to go till six, right? And so I pick up my things, I think, and I get in my car and I go all the way back to Orange County. I don't have my cell phone. So, I am so mad at myself. So I go back to, I drive all the way back there. And I go in this room, you guys, and this is the spirit. I go in this room, and I walk in this room, just like I'd be walking in here with you guys, and you're all, uh, all of the faces turned around, <laughs> and they just started clapping. We 
we are so glad that you came back. We are so glad that you left your cell phone there. Where are you going? You know, it was like God, it was like the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. Where are you going, Charlotte? I just brought you to the place where this gentleman talked to you like a like reality was really being talked to me. Like when you tap your unsuspected <coughs> inner resources strength, you're gonna tap the genius writer. And then you'll unblock yourself. So I'm all happy about that, but I'm not happy about paying $5,000, you know, to go to his little seminar thing. So, but you know what? When I went back in that room, you guys, that was the miracle part of it. That was the, the tapping of the Holy Spirit. And, and they said, we saved your seat. And your phone's right here. Come and sit back down. And then that, from that process to the end of the day, was exactly what I needed to unblock myself from the not writing anymore. <laughs> so, so it's not, if you're right, it's not emotion. See, I got all emotional and jumped up and ran out of there. I can't do this, blah, 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 and, you know, and then when I went back, the Holy Spirit spoke to me again and said, this is where I asked you to go. Get your butt back over here. <laughs> That's a good, you can't mess it up. You can't mess it up story, you know. I can't you, you're the always at the right place at the right time. Yeah, we've had a lot of those too. We've had a lot. It's very obvious. But that's part, that becomes your prayer, make it obvious, make it, show me, make it obvious. You know, you start to say, oh, that's a good prayer. Well, can I just say what happened here today? And I just realized that I was asking Kristen if there was, you know, a sign that I'm getting ready and I feel like so alienated from the people where I live. And, I, and she closed her eyes and I, she, I said, are you getting it? She said, I just get that you can't do it alone. I walk out here, I meet this woman who is doing the silent retreat the end of the month with me, and doing the tabula rasa, same exact event. And it's like, you can't do it alone, come out here, here she is. We both come here, and we're both doing the same, two. it's like that is answer to prayer, that's Holy Spirit. Yes. And I just, it didn't even, I, it was so obvious, I couldn't even see it right away, and I thought, oh my God, she's the one that's here, so I don't have to do it alone. So beautiful. <laughs> it's so incredible. Oh, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It's kind of an, that's that idea that if if something is meant to happen, nothing can prevent it from happening. Yeah. Yes. And if something's not meant to happen, mm -hmm. nothing can make it happen. Yeah, right. You know, there's something that gets very light in us when we're going, whoa, you mean, and, and that's what the the Course says, it's actually in the workbook, Jesus says, what happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. That's spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> that just is total 100% responsibility. You yeah. know, you, there's no room for blame, there's no room for coulda, woulda, shoulda. Chance, there's no chance. There's no chance, there's no luck, there's no hypotheticals. You know, it's it's so restful when you hear that and your heart just goes, oh, sighs. And, and then when you start to see these obvious signs, like you two coming together, as obvious and rapid answer to prayer, rapid answer to the question, then you go, hmm, can I have my whole life be like that? Thank you very much. And, and the Spirit's like, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm, that's my point, is to make everything that crystal clear, that obvious. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And it's always, and a, the prayer is always like for both in this yeah. case, because I, it's all I kept hearing, like not to do it alone. I was always almost going to say the words, pray for a mighty companion to do this with you, and I couldn't, the words wouldn't come out. Okay. And then I was sitting outside, and I looked and saw you two talking. I'm like, oh. <laughs> it happened, and then I joined with Alexa outside, and she was saying, can we just pray, are you hearing anything from me so that I can stay on track? And I'm like, Rita, <laughs> you have an assignment. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> it's like Beautiful. Holy Spirit matchmaking yeah. Yeah. in a way. <laughs> like, We've already exchanged numbers for you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and it is. It's such a gift because you're both like really going for it, wanting to stay really focused and take all these steps for unwinding and undoing. Mm -hmm. And it's such a gift for both. It doesn't matter which one seems to be doing the unwinding or supporting the unwinding. It's strengthening the truth for both. Yeah. So it's always such a gift. Mutual gift to receive the help, you know, yeah. and give it. So. I have a co worker that I spend the whole day with that talks and talks about the world. showing me something. Yeah, the power of prayer is, is whenever anyone's talking to you, it, it's really the prayer of the heart is, what, what is this co-worker really asking for? Because it's, it's like not what the surface is going on, but it's what's underneath there. Because what Whatever we say to a brother or to a sister is what we most need to hear. Okay. It's, it's as if there's two bodies, but it's actually the mind, when it's in that prayer, I want to be truly helpful, then whatever is spoken is what you need to hear. And, and then as you find, as you allow yourself to be spoken through more, that's a, a beautiful phase of trusting and letting go. And then there can be times when you go and have a gathering and you hear certain things. That's also in the book where where, when Kirsten was first traveling with me, I think we went to South America, um, we would go to these gatherings and people would ask questions, and I did most of the talk, and, and Kirsten was there traveling with me, we had the rings on, we're there, and I did most of the talk, and then after so, uh, some of those gatherings, then the ego flared up a little bit, like, what do you think I am, a handbag? <laughs> you think I'm like a, a handbag? Is that An cool? accessory. An accessory? <laughs> like, you put the rings on and now you've got an accessory to travel with and everything. And so, at one point when she exposed that to me, I said, oh. I said, well then you can, you can lead the gathering uh, tomorrow. And she was like, oh, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't speak to the... Da, da, da. But then there came points of, again, going back to Jesus and working it through in the mind, where there came a point where we did a gathering and... And was it everything the that I before, spoke the night before? I received a download for two hours because I went in prayer to see what was going on, why I felt so much competition. I didn't even know it was competition, but that's what was coming up. Pride and competition and wanting to, wanting to be the one speaking. And, and then I saw <coughs> that and it just popped. And, and then I just received this beautiful download from the Spirit for like two hours that night in the wee hours of, of the morning. And then at the very next gathering, David opened his mouth and the whole talk <coughs> that I'd heard came out of his mouth. Wow. And it was a beautiful demonstration that it's like the Spirit... It doesn't matter which body it is. It's like the message of the Spirit wants to come through in the most beneficial way, in the best use of time, in the clearest channel. And here I was, <laughs> very clearly not a clear channel, <laughs> going through all kinds of healing at that time. And yeah, it's beautiful. So the co-workers just, it's more of just, a, it's an opportunity for prayer. And it just like, is there is there something that I'm to to extend to be helpful or not. Sometimes, so many times, it's we can be beautiful listeners, we can smile, we can give a hug, and there's so many things that are even non-verbal, that are like the best, the most that can come through. Mm -hmm. But just this practice, it's at really being in that prayer, I'm here to be truly helpful, you know, from the beginning of the course, and then to get into that, so it becomes like your habit miraculous habit of, I'm, I'm here to serve. And you let go of the preconceptions and then it starts to get easier and easier. But you'll be sent people where 
you know, the ego will try to want to interpret something on the surface, like they're talking about the world. I don't want to hear about the, the world, but is there anything I'm to say or do? You also have lots of things happening in your dreamscape, which could shift a lot of things around pretty quickly, and you're just trying to stay very attentive and open to those promptings, and yeah, that's where your mind really needs to be focused. There's no need to analyze anything, you don't need to. Just don't talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Strong. I love that holiness tape. I have it in my car. It's just plays around. It's an, an album, right? Or is it song? The holiness album. I said tape. Yeah, yeah. But the CD. The CD. Album. Well, we're winding down. Is there any final thing anybody wants to share? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, my husband is not into the purpose that we're talking about here. So am I just being disillusional to think that I can, I can um, heal myself for it that way, but use that relationship for healing. Just think, well, as long as one person sees it as a holy relationship, then it is a holy relationship. Is that true? Well, I think we have been talking about purpose and shared purpose, and I would say that as purpose becomes more clear to you and more important, does get more obvious as well. Yeah. Everything starts to feel more and more obvious. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been your prayer yourself of deepening in purpose. That is where the focus belongs. And then, I, for myself, the deeper I went into that, and the more I was praying before I'd go through every doorway, and just praying to be aligned and, and everything, then Everything became more obvious, and, and I wasn't willing to compromise the purpose. I, I started to really let go of trying to please people, or do things that looked acceptable. Like the Beatles, you know, they kept going and going, and the more they went into their purpose, I think, the more they didn't fit into boxes. I don't think they fit in very well at the beginning, but, but the further it went, it was more of a sense like, oh, I'm not so concerned about how this looks or what people think or feel. I want to be happy. Yeah. And uh, so, I think, I think that is, is a thing like, that we've had that in our community and with different ones, and it's interesting, your, your namesake in our community um, actually uh, was married, and uh, quite a few years ago was starting to come to, to the turning points where she's, she was saying, well, I like this about him, and he's this, and he's this, and he's this, and he's this, and this, and then I think Jason was with me, we were sitting with her by the river, and Jason asked her something like, um, does... Does he help you with does, your mind training? Does he help you with your mind training? And then there was a second question too about supporting. Yeah. What support you with your mind? Does he support you? Does he support you in your mind training or purpose? Mm -hmm. And you start to to run your thoughts through that, mm -hmm. not just with a partner, but you start to run through your daily life. Like, are there aspects of my life or my partner? Is it very supportive and conducing, and is it helping me, nurturing me? on the direction that I'm going. Because I remember, I was raised in Christianity, and I remember reading some stuff from Jesus in the Bible. It was like, you know, father will be turned against son, and mother turned against daughter for my namesake. And I was like, what is that? Well, where is that coming from, and this and that? I started to realize that what Jesus was talking about was 
that there's a vibration. Some are reflections of our desire to wake up, and some are reflections of our desire to stay asleep. And the sleeping reflections are going to be the naysayers, doubting, questioning, always like throwing obstacles. Is this what you really want? I don't know what you're doing that for. Well, that seems like a waste of time. They want your money. <laughs> they want your money. How much is this going to run you? How much? Yeah. How much, you know, it's like after a while, we all should we should have like a way of coding that, like a certain color. Like when the comment comes, then then on sudden they they have an aura and they turn a certain color, green or something, and, go, and all you do is go green, green, green. But but we have to become more discerning. Uh, about that. And then there are those that are very loving and accepting and supporting, and we could say just about anything. And they go, ah, and give us a big hug. No matter what we say, they just, aw. And then it's like, so they could be color coded <laughs> in another way, like very, very purple. purple. <laughs> we're, all, we're all thinking the same. Ooh, a, we got a purple one here, thank you, you know. But we do get better at that, and there, there definitely is a difference in purpose. You know, the ego and the spirit don't have a meeting point. The ego always speaks first. It's raucous shrieks, it's judgments, it's criticisms, and doubts, and so on and so forth. And the spirit is very much like you were saying, it's, it's very matter of fact, it's very simple, it's very clear. It waits for the ego to say its thing, and then it just comes in with this soft, <laughs> clear, direct, simple thing. So, to me, that's what discernment is. I think that's, if you could yeah. work on one thing in your life, it would be getting clearer and clearer on that, that discernment. And then acting and, and, and moving forward with that, that discernment. But I first have to heal any hidden desires to like be supported by the world rather than the spirit because I'm calling in witnesses to any beliefs that I have so rather than just saying well you don't align so bye I'm leaving because I still have that unhealed part of me that I actually have to address yeah that gives an honesty like what is this showing me yeah, always. That I would choose him. Or even that the Spirit would say, go marry him. Ask him to marry you. Because I asked. And he was definitely someone who wasn't spiritually inclined. And I knew that. So, I must have a desire to delay it. <laughs> that I would marry somebody like that. But I am learning a lot about myself irritates the heck out of me, just like <laughs> to relate to. You're enjoying this book, you're saying. Yeah, I'm reading it very slowly, and I'm going, okay, how does this apply mm. to me, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So much for inviting us. It's like here we are back in the family. I, it was fun for me coming here because Kirsten and, and Jeffrey were coming here, and I had I had this whole wonderful experience. And I said, "Oh, you guys are in for such a treat! You're gonna love this. You're gonna so enjoy this." And yeah, <laughs> then you came. And then, yeah, then. Well, then she when it's, it's mystical experience, and she called me on the phone and said, "I, I don't know." I, I think I've got a tour coming up, but you know, I'm overwhelmed. I'm what overwhelmed. if I have to decide something? I couldn't even pack. She couldn't right? pack. She <laughs> the three to pack for me. Somebody else packed. And I'm like, I have no idea. Trying to, okay, how many days? How many clothes does that mean? What kind of clothes? I don't know. <laughs> and then the day before coming here, I went and she was kind of curled up on on the bed, and there was. Uh, James um, over there, and then there was a suitcase 
and they were both kind of looking at the suitcase, and it was packed pretty high, but that was, that was a product of a lot of, a, a lot of stuff went in to get the logistics back. So I said, oh, I'm, I'm open to coming out there, you know, nobody has to twist my, my arm to get me out there. The Topanga Canyon into California, so yeah, it was very spontaneous. And then Diana, who had been helping organize, she said, I felt it, I knew it, I felt it, I felt, you know, again, it's the telepathy, so it's part, it was in the script, and it just kind of seemed to come in. I was just, after being in Europe, I was just kind of resting for a while, but I'm so glad I came. So <laughs> Alexander swimming down there in the swimming pool, inviting me down there. Yeah, maybe. We're loving, we're loving the script. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. It's fun, and then the group we have on Facebook. Yeah, and yeah that's awesome. All the ways of staying in contact. Everybody should okay. join here. If they're not on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the rage. I had to do it. It's all the rage. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I always like to say too that I feel like everyone I meet, I feel like we're on this lifelong journey. So we are lifelong friends along the way, happily holding hands, skipping along, opening to the light, and, and loving every bit of it. So that's very much in alignment with what the book's about. That, that that's how the book kind of ends. Like it's this thing that this love goes on and on and on and on. And the parables are just kind of a a little pointer, like the the master pointing at the moon. You know, it's like the book's the same. It's the same, it's rare, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> There's the last four words, the end, the beginning. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and Chris has got a song on one of her albums called Quantum Love, if you oh. ever get a chance. That's, she just got a download of all the lyrics, but it's really everything we've been talking about today. It cannot be contained. It's all we wanted. It's who we are. It's all we wanted. See, I know everything. I feel like I'm not... I told Chris, I feel like I know everything about you. I feel like you're already my sister. If this person we've ever met, but... I have this little virtual life in my head. <laughs> a virtual life. <laughs> <laughs> It's a virtual life, uh, yeah.